Cool. A double intro. <laughs> All righty. That, that was awesome, man. We had double, man. That's double. Double trouble. <laughs> Let's get it. Well, yeah, guys, it is Monday, October 25th. Eric and I are coming at you live. Travis had some family issues he's taking care of real quick. Got to put the kids to bed, all that good stuff. So we're going to start off the show for you. Got a good one lined up tonight. Got a couple of representatives from St. Croix Rods going to be talking to us. Pretty excited to hear all about that. And then Eric and Travis, I know we're going to talk a little bit as well about their recent adventure up there in the St. Lawrence, Lake Ontario area. So going to be a good one tonight guys glad you could join us and hope we can uh, entertain you for the next couple hours <laughs> let me tell you something man i'm still laughing from that weekend really? that was that was crazy just i mean crazy for me because you know i caught a couple new species i've never been salmon fishing and so to go try to catch them on crankbaits and bass tackle was absolutely whacked out at night yeah had a spooky encounter on the river I still can't explain it. I have photographic evidence potentially of a spirit that was bugging us. Um, oh, and we didn't discover that till we rolled up in Pennsylvania and got home. I'm like, could, could, could you, you explain this picture on my phone? He goes, no, dude. Uh -oh. <laughs> and I'm like, Look at it. So, man, the hair on the back of my neck was standing up after that one. So, yeah, man, I caught I caught one the first night that, you know, was my first in my PB. And then the second night I, I caught another one that was absolutely giant. They don't get much bigger than that in that river. I think it was close to 40 pounds, man. We didn't have a scale, but it was, I don't know, man, it was long. You saw the yeah, picture. It was sure. ridiculous. And they, and they both ate the bait. I caught them on a jointed Rapala Fire Tiger J11 with a couple split shot about six to eight inches above the bait just to keep it down. I mean, you're basically casting as far as you can out into these rapids and, you know, there's a stream, the, the river's flowing. It's the Black River. And, I, you know, if you reeled it really fast, you'd hook a bunch of them, probably mm -hmm. snagging them. Yeah. Um, but if you actually, I started worming the crankbait or my Rapala J11, I'd pull it and feel it wiggling because it had good current to make it wobble, if you will, wiggle. And then if I hit rock, I'd stop it. And, you know, I think that thing was floating back in the current. And then I would engage to pull again. And that's when they would hit. That's and awesome. It, you lose a lot, man. It's crazy. I was like over 10 on hookups. <laughs> and you'd roll over them. So, you know, you knew where you were in the back of a few. Sure. You're throwing a treble hook bait. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, it's crazy. It sounds way cooler on a spinning rod because some of those fish are screaming off 50 yards, 75 yards. Who knows how many yards upstream they're going. And they cut you off on a rock. So it's just really crazy. And there was a, there, you know, so we were on the boat. Uh, we hooked up a bunch. We didn't land any. Had a spooky encounter. I'm like, let's go. It's getting late, close to 11. We get to the shore. I see some guys hook up that are on this concrete walkway next to the ramp. And I'm like, let's just hang for a little bit, you know. So we're still throwing crankbaits, losing a ton of baits, man, because you get snagged. You're, it's over. And uh, I saw a couple guys like hooking up. We were throwing. A wiggle wart style bait, a rock crawler from Spro, custom painted in pinks, blacks, and uh, what was the other color? I don't know, but pinks and blacks and 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 I think it was chartreusey. Anyway, but they were using minnows, and I'm like, "What do you got in this box?" So I took out a big J13 with like a triangle lip, man, and started pulling and worming that. I hooked one. He jumped three times and then broke me off on a rock. That was a sounded big. And then I got the the J11 out, which is not a big bait, man. It's only, you know, probably about that big. And um, put the split shot on, man, and fished hard and missed a bunch. And I had one as I was pulling the bait out of the water that boiled at it. So they really Ooh. wanted, some wanted to eat it. So there were, hmm. there were salmon right in front of you. They're jumping everywhere. It's like cuckoo because you've got these fish jumping at night everywhere around you. Downstream, you can hear it. Upstream, people are hooking up, breaking off. Landed a few, and then I hooked up, man, and that was uh, landed that first one. It was awesome, and then the second night yeah. landed that second one. It was crazy because I went all the way to the end of this concrete walkway. I heard a bunch of fish. It got way shallow in there, so I made a downstream cast and was worming it upstream, and I hooked that fish at about midnight, man. Uh, That's crazy, yeah, man. Kate Vincent Kent was there, and he hooked up a <laughs> bunch too. Travis hooked up a bunch. For sure, it was, it was just nuts, man. What an experience, though, right? So uh, you know, I have to thank yeah. Travis for turning me on to it. Absolutely. And then no. We went to Champlain and and caught uh, two northern pikes. 
Uh, one on my JDM chatterbait, which was really cool, man. <laughs> you, you know, it was at the end of a cast, and I thought I had a big bass because I just I'd caught yeah. a couple fish spinnerbaiting, mm -hmm. and I'm like, man, this bass is fighting funny, and it was a big like 30 inch northern. He was really skinny though. And I'd caught a smaller northern earlier on a jerk bait that I thought he was going to bite off. But uh, we got Travis landed both of them for me, man. I appreciate it. Because after I got my salmon bite, I now have King Salmon DNA coursing through my body. <laughs> so I'm holding up that giant salmon. Let, let me dial yep. it back to a couple days earlier in the week. And Travis is instructing me while I'm holding this fish, like get your fingers out of the picture on the top of the fish near the mouth. And I, I don't know how to hold this fish, clearly. I've never right. held a fish that big that has teeth. So he goes, put it under the other gill plate. And I try to move my hands because I got him pinched between both gill plates under the chin. And so as I'm trying to move back on the other side, he freaking like buckles. And as he's going down, man, he freaking rakes me with his hook jaw and tooth or oh. teeth. And I'm bleeding like a stuck pig, man. So so can you guys, can you guys, it's, the, it's healed up, but yeah. Those those were pretty deep gashes on Sunday night, and um, man, I'm bleeding pretty good for the video. So hopefully that's gonna be that's good. I'm you know wiping it on the bench, and you know we're, we're, I'm taking pictures with blood on my hand. I'm like, all right, it's oh, time to man. probably get some hand sanitizer on this. So we walk up to the truck, slather it with hand sanitizer, get a, like a microfiber cloth. It's probably not clean, you know, rubbing it down. Morris hand sanitizer. Travis takes out the first aid kit. Man, he was a good nurse, dude. Good man. Hey, he, I take he care was of like, you. He's like, let's put the Band-Aid this way so it closes the flaps of skin. And then he had some tape and taped it up, and we went back to fishing. Awesome, so the, man. So the next day, we go to the Cortland Line Factory. We tell Brooks at Cortland Braid. We got the factory tour, which was really cool. You'll see a yeah. video of that. And um, uh, Travis, like, I told Brooks, I'm like, yeah, man, you see my hand. I got tape on it. You know, Sam and got me. He goes, dude, dude, my, my friend almost lost his thumb because of a salmon bite and travis was like earlier you know the day you'll be fine man it's good it's good <laughs> and so travis was like what and mother was like what yeah man but uh, i kept a good eye on it kept it clean you know and uh no, no infection so i guess i dodged a bullet but now i got king salmon in my body man absolutely man That's coursing through my veins <laughs> <laughs> so Eric, I know you talked about, you know, that was the first time you got salmon fishing, new species, some new techniques, all that kind of stuff. Do you think there was anything you learned fishing for salmon that you could relate back to bass fishing or maybe fishing for any other kind of fish? Interesting. You know, I talk about this a lot, actually, worming a crankbait. You know, I mean, there are lots of ways to retrieve a crankbait, right? Mm -hmm. um, when I worm a crankbait, I'm not controlling the speed and depth with my reel, per se. I'm reeling it down to depth, and then I'm pulling whether it's three feet, 10 feet, or 20 feet, if you've got the proper diving depth, um, I'm pulling it with the rod to feel the cover because, man, it was tough to get a bait through there. We went through, I don't know, 20 crankbaits and plugs that night. That was crazy. Wow. We were we were breaking off. And those are high-dollar baits because yeah. custom. some were just right out of the box, you know, but they're all like the custom-painted ones are pretty expensive. So, mm -hmm. um you know, you'll watch the video and see how many times we break off. But I'm like, I'm not, I, these aren't my plugs. I'm not going to break these off. So I, I made myself do that. But that seemed to be the way as I was worming it and contacting the cover. You know, I imagine the salmon sitting there in the stream, moving upstream right. to spawn or spawning right there. And so if I pulled it versus burning it, you definitely hooked up more, bump more fish burning it. Okay. But it was at night. I don't know what they see. I'm giving that fish a chance as I worm it and pause it. You know, it's moving downstream. After I pause it, I didn't feed it line per se, but it stops and it's wiggling in the current. And then I go to engage and it's fleeing. And that triggered the bite for me Yeah, that where they actually ate the bait. And that was hard to get them to eat it. You could hook them sure. in the back and the tail and the head, but to get them to eat it was tough. And, and both the ones I caught, they ate it. Uh, and I did it the same way, worming the crankbait, not steady reeling. Yeah. So to me, I, I've had a lot of success doing that in colder water temperatures uh, where the fish are inactive or if I want to feel the cover. I feel like I have much better feel if I'm not doing this with my hand sure. and I'm pulling the bait, stopping it, reeling up the slack, pull, reel up the slack, pull, you know, especially if I'm, if I'm banging and digging. Absolutely. I can really feel like if I hit a big rock, I can feel it versus hitting pea gravel because, you know, if you've got a decent enough rod uh with good line it's transferring that sensation so yeah man we're in a crankbait man hey, what yeah. is it salmon crush 
Come on. Yep. <laughs> it is, man. We're changing it, man. We're changing from to, to, to Salmon Crush, man. Hey, sorry I'm late, running late, but here we are. 8-11, slightly late. I've been, been worse. Oh, yeah. But I've been on time quite a bit. I just want to first say thank you for Epic Eric and Alex for joining me tonight. We got a great live coming up. St. Croix Rods in the house shortly. We're going to be talking with Dan Johnson, who's a national sales manager, as well as Ryan Teach. Uh, they'll be joining us here in about 20 minutes. Until then, we're going to talk a little bit about our epic week, and I call a little bit about the salmon adventures and the was... fact that I think you talked about the bloody finger. I heard a little bit of that. Oh, yeah. Bloody palms fishing, man. Bad. Dude. And <laughs> I told him what Brooks said. I'm like, because Travis was like, ah, I'd be all right. And in my mind, I'm going, man, I don't know what's oh, in yeah. that river. What kind of bacteria is <laughs> in a salmon tooth? What the hell? You know? And then Brooks goes, yeah, my buddy almost lost his thumb. They had to mm -hmm. go to the nurse and squeeze out the pus every yeah. day for like a week. So, no, we're good, man. We're good, man. And then, of course, uh, the whole Monster Bass wow. weekend. Pretty damn cool. Sounded like it. Heck, yeah. So are you guys filming product videos? Or was it just it's how I fish an ad rig? What kind of content were you guys making up there? Hmm. Well, it was, it was more of just kind of a get-together. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not really product. Although we did fish a few of the monster bass products as well. A lot of it was just trying to uh, get good content with fish catches on film. And we had one of the best camera guys I've had in a long time in the boat with us. Uh, Man. Sam. His, his drone. Awesome job. <sighs> Samuel Moore Media, check him out, man. He's got a drone that he made himself, flies 120 miles an hour. And he was an, a wizard with his aerial tricks, man, doing barrel rolls and flips. And, I mean, whizzing around boats. It was just crazy. And he wore this crazy, like, you know, AI helmet, man. I felt like I was in Call of Duty Black Ops or something. I don't even play the game, man. He's wigging out as we're driving the bass boat, getting the takeoff scene. It was cool, man. Really cool. I think he got some incredible shots with the drone. In, in the boat. It, he had a cinematic camera, Alex. I mean, the quality yeah. of this footage is going to be unlike anything I've ever been a part of. Um, yeah, it's not GoPro level. It's the next, next, next level. Cinematic camera, like movie camera. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. So, Travis, I got to ask you. So when you guys were up there, I was asking for some pictures that I could use on your website. And Eric sent me a bunch of fish catches, all these great pictures. And I didn't get too many from you. So I was curious, you know, did Eric catch all the fish? Was he back boating? You know, was he cutting your line <laughs> off right before you threw? What was going on? So when I fish, I, I sometimes get into a, a, a zone <laughs> in my head. And pretty much the phone is put away. I, I don't drink. I don't eat. All I do is try to catch fish. And that was kind of the deal because we had a tournament. Yeah. Uh, I did get a few uh I did get a few pictures for sure. But it was uh it was pretty intense. I fished pretty hard. You 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 know, you're up there having fun with people and you want to relax. Mm -hmm. And even I don't know how to turn that switch off from tournament mode to just <laughs> fun fishing and having fun. Yeah. So, and Eric was kind of the same way, although he did get his phone out a little bit more than, sure, than I did. But we certainly Absolutely. caught a lot. It was uh, wasn't Crazy. supposed to be a tournament, but it ended up being one. <laughs> Just record your five biggest bass, and we had uh, we took second on day one. We lost by a couple ounces, and then of course I wasn't going to let that happen again. He two. was a man possessed. But we had 25 and 25. So we I did, mean that's yeah. not terrible. Yep. Pretty damn good. You know. Pretty good to follow it up too. So what were they biting on up there? Was it a shallow bite? Mm -hmm. Were they roaming around? You know, just well, they're definitely roaming. There was some deep fish too. Okay. So we had three guys in the boat. So you remember, whenever you have three guys, and one was of course Rick from Monster Bass. So we have to try to get him in 
position to make accurate casts because we want to see him have a good time too. Mm-hmm. I took so, care of that because Travis was possessed in the front. <laughs> and so <laughs> drifting, which is probably going to get the bigger bites, drifting out in that 20 yeah. to 30 foot of water uh, with a drop shot or a football head would probably have been the best choice. But with three guys in the boat, drifting with the current is very difficult. Sure. Very. You know, the very one guy difficult. who's not up there is not going to be able to fish properly. So we um, we stuck it out shallow. Well, I would say four to 12 feet of water seemed to be the, yeah. the right depth. Sure. Yeah. And Rick caught some good ones. He had three in the bag on day one. He did. Yeah, Rick crushed them. I mean, three he of did, the fish man. on day one. And, you know, the weather wasn't that co- cooperative on day one. So we had some pretty heavy winds. Yeah. And there was some people. Uh, I mean, first, shout out to everybody that was there. Larry, Todd, Paul, Burley Fishing, all those guys. I don't know if you said anything about that, Eric. No, no, no. I, I I put a post up on the instant, tagged everybody. Yeah, man. Uh, sure. Jeff but, Burling. I mean, Paul, like Paul Larry's Glass. from Alabama who doesn't experience salmon or salmon salmon fishing smallmouth fishing although we experienced a little salmon fishing too and then of course burley and paul are from michigan but they don't have the opportunity to fish the saint lawrence as much and so they had a blast like people were catching personal best every every other hour right they'd be breaking theirs and i think everyone uh just had a wonderful time catching fish because they were cooperating but it was cold and windy on day one Day two was almost the opposite. Well, still cold, but but no wind. And so it didn't feel as cold. But there was definitely ice on the boat that morning. And it made it the bite a little bit more difficult. We <laughs> we thought we could get them on swim baits like we were the other day, uh, yesterday, the day before. Uh, I, I fished a net rig most of the day, and you had to really pick it apart. Big time. What Big do you think time. about... So, and then the first thing in the morning, it's so cold and, you know, sometimes with gloves on, you lose grip of your rod. Mm -hmm. We had a little incident. We had two incidents, man. They were almost. uh, Oh, shoot. Let's talk about the first incident. (laughs) Which one? All right. Uh, Yeah. Talk, talk about the first one. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So I've lost maybe three rods in my whole life. And most of it's because I forget to strap it down and I hit some other someone else's boat wake when i'm just trying to run to a quick spot and i know they're not strapped and they fall off okay so i was digging around for a bait or for a rod in the rod locker and i had a bunch of them up on the deck and i'm very careful when i open the lid Every time, except for this time. Well, I'm pa- I'm panicking every time you open that lid. By the way, I I because I, 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 it just it, it astonishes me. And I'm with a lot of boaters, and I've never seen a rod go over. But I'm looking at them going, I can't believe they're not fucking going in. Well, anyway, I you're very sh- I you're sure. very good at it. You're very good at it. So, but I I want you to know, most of the time, if you open a locker, I'm looking. This time, I didn't happen to look. Right. But when I turned around, so I opened it show. and instantly realized I'm in, I'm going to have a situation here. Two rods. Uh, at the time, we didn't know which ones. Uh, sp- I thought they were both spinning, but I lost a, a spinning rod and a baitcaster fall over the side of the boat. So I instantly grabbed the rod that's in my hand and I, I grabbed the other rods with it, trying to keep them up. So they, you had both floating. rods. Cu- I, I had both I was rods at the once, end- once I was slipped at the- down. At I was the at same, the end of a yeah. I was at the end of a long. You make all the excuses you want. Oh no! I, I buddy... froze. I froze. I froze. I'm like he's sticking the rod in the water quick. Like total great reaction on his part. He's got them both coming up. But what you don't realize is the boat is moving. We're not spot locked, so we're drifting. There's current. He's mm-hmm. so he's got both coming up. Like oh, situation's fine, and I'm still frozen. And then he goes, a, a good friend me. would have instantly so, got their rod me. out and tried to get that rod back. Anyways, long story short, one rod goes down. I recover the other one. And we basically, uh, I'm like, this is great. It's only eight, nine feet of water, but there's current and uh, somewhat cloudy. So visibility wasn't good. And so we looked, we looked with the underwater camera for quite a while. And then Will said, 
well, let's go back and get the flogger and I can probably find it. So I had a trail right now, real tight in the area where that rod went down. And so we ran back, got the flogger, came Wait, back. Can I, can I just say something before sure. the, like you just went in, like you were going to go get the flogger. Uh -huh. Travis like, well, that's fucking 800 bucks. I just lost. Fuck it. I'm not, no, we're not doing this. Let's go. And he wants to just move to the next spot and fish. He's just done. Uh, he's done. We're never finding it. And Will's like, Travis, let me go get the flogger. And he had to talk him into it. And Travis like, we're never going to find it. No way. And I'm like thinking to myself, I don't think so either, but let's go get the flogger. <laughs> so we, we get the flogger, come back. Travis got the camera. Will's got the flogger. Mm -hmm. And he's got, he's got the GPS marks. I, I don't know how you navigated the boat. Even to the close area, because if you look like the mark, if you look at what what it looked like on the map, and I keep telling him to zoom in, he goes, "It zoomed all the way in, dude," and it looks like this. <laughs> you can't fucking see anything. It's like, what fucking line are you gonna follow? And Travis got within like 20, 10 yards of it. And Will goes, "There it is." I'm like, "No freaking way." So, so basically, uh, what what I had to do. Well, we got it back, right? We recovered it. Will well, found it. Tell him what you recovered it on. So I used a... Um, Homicide a Glide from ABT. Okay. Custom painted perch from uh, TK Attack Craft. Craft. Yeah, I used a big swim bait. I was able to reach down in there, With scoop the it up. seven foot arms. and wasn't and, a big deal. Um, <laughs> seven foot rod. So he got the 14 feet with the length of the rod and his arm. We got her back. Pretty cool. Mo yeah, I think it's going to be a funny fucking video that day was crazy funny it at some point we're yeah. like like let's record some of the ch ba banter in the boat and then all of a sudden people are going like i'm saving that clip i'm saving this that was funny <laughs> stuff that we would normally not push save on so we got a lot of funny clips i think i hope it, i i was laughing my head off so i right, hope it's right funny. right i think it's gonna be a good sure. funny video yeah vlogging in october so what was oh, the, the second incident you ran into while you up there? Mm. Well, let's see. So it was day two, early morning. And Rick is in the back of the boat fishing. And I hear a splash. And I As thought maybe I. Rick fell in the water. Oh. I saw the rod go in the water because Travis is faced forward. I'm facing, you know, like out of the corner of my eye. And I basically watched Rick try to cast and the rod just goes straight down in. <laughs> I've done that way too many times. Really? That's a common oh, thing? I do it a lot because I, <laughs> when I get into it, like you do, Travis, you know, I start trying to whip that thing. And next thing I know, the court gets wet. You and do it a lot. You lose rods a lot. No, I don't head. lose them. I can just. I okay. get quick on it, and you know if I got a buddy in there, stick his rod in there. But wow! Yes, they they've gone overboard several times. I see why people put those little <laughs> floaties on the end. Of <laughs> so Rick, like a freaking cat-like lightning bolt, goes to his chest as fast as I've e ever seen anybody go down, and shoots his arm in the water and grabs that thing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that was impressive, man. Because I froze, I, I froze twice with lost rods in the water, man. I was, I absolutely, I was like, it's over, man. I, I was just already <laughs> deciding the rod is gone. Now that I was watched it in sink 20, mode. 30 feet of water, right? Yeah, we weren't going to get that one back. Uh, uh, no. And that was a, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a new legend extreme. So I gave him the, uh, I gave him the highest end level fishing rod he could have in his hand and the best reel and the perfect setup to help him get a fish and uh he, like i said he did a great job but uh it was a little intense there but he grabbed it <laughs> he grabbed it quick a little Man, little cold hands after that that, that could have been a 1600 hundred dollar weekend for you and rods and reels <laughs> good point good point wow right? oh uh, i can't believe we recovered i mean i can't believe he got that one but we're definitely would, gonna have we're, we're gonna have just a, watch it sink <laughs> We're going to have awesome, awesome coverage of that the whole three days up there. Again, uh, I want to thank everyone that came up. And, of course, uh, Sam, who put, who's going to probably put together one of the most excellent productions when it comes to uh, film and smallmouth fishing. Uh, mm. The extremes he went to to get the angles, to get the uh, – there was a lot going in there. I mean, he was, a, like Eric said, directing the movie right in oh, front yeah. of us. Oh, yeah. Uh, very professional, telling us where to – 
you know, when, when there was another boat, we would come up, he would jump in that boat. He would get really good angles with the fish catches. Of course, he was telling us which way to make sure the fish is this way and the sun's hitting it at that angle. I mean, it was a little intense, but we got it. I think oh, yeah. we got some really good shots. And of course, I mean, for him to fly that drone around a 140 foot long freighter, right? Uh, that's oh, yeah. be an epic shot. Unbelievable, man. And he buzzed the wedding. And the wedding. Taking the, taking the this round. drone goes 120 miles an hour. He saw the tents on the shore and he goes, well, let me just fly by that and see what's going on. And he said he saw the bride and groom. was like, wow. Man, do you have any good stories for crashing a drone in a tree or an eagle swooping out of the sky? Anything good like he that? He did. He did. He he chased. Some, yeah. Yeah. He was. Uh, he has a lot. He actually travels. That's what he does. Um, okay. He's got a whole bunch of people working for him. And is it Sam Moore Productions, Eric? Yes. Yeah, Sam, Samuel Moore Media. Good stuff. Sam, so, Samuel Moore Media. We're looking forward to bringing that out. And, of course, all of us did individual videos as well this past weekend. Eric and I are going to have our uh, our video about the Nico Bates. We also did a video on the uh, salmon fishing that took place. And then just that fun day with Will up there having a bunch of laughs and catching some, some good fish. We fished from sunup to sundown uh, uh, that day. So uh, it was awesome. It was awesome. Anything else sure. we got to cover before we move on here, Eric? I think we're good. I, I reached um, out just to give you guys the show schedule coming up. Oh, there's a lot to uh, cover. I'm sorry. Well, wait a minute. I mean, I want to mention that there there was – I told everybody about our spirit encounter, the dark spirit encounter on the river. Yes, there you uh, go. It, it might be told on the live Halloween special on Sunday. Yes. Um, there was a picture that I didn't look at until I got home with Travis, and it was from Travis – with me on the river in this area, him holding up the Q beam light that illuminates everything. And there is this dark figure right in front of us. And I can't explain what my camera picked up. And he goes, that's the dark force that was in that corner. <laughs> I can't and wait to hair, share the story. The hair, it's the hair on making... the back of my neck. I'm telling you, man, I am convinced that there was... Uh, did your did we get video of what we saw? I Being... have to check the footage, but he, here's what I know, guys. We're not just making this up because we have a Halloween special on the 31st. This legit happened, and for Eric to say something and and get nervous, I mean, you could see me. I, I'll freak out over anything. We we first thought it was somebody screwing with us on the bank, sure, but with a Q beam to illuminate an entire bluff wall, and you see nobody. And then you look to the left and see an abandoned factory that's burnt out. I'm getting chills talking about it. And then you're looking in the hollowed out windows and vines and you're going, uh, <laughs> is that somebody that go. died there that <laughs> used the fish in this corner on their lunch break and they're still there and they haven't crossed over to the other side and they're giving us a signal, get out of my salmon hole? It could have been. And then moments later, there's a hookup. But I thought we weren't saying the... the story. We're saving uh, it for the. Uh, I'm not going to go for the rest of it. It okay. was extraordinarily weird. So I guys, was the, eased out, man. The 31st, we're going to be having our Halloween special, first ever. We might just be in costumes. Let me know in the comments what you want to see me dressed up as. Uh, that's going to start at 8 o'clock. Of course, we're going to have Brian the Carpenter from the Ike Live Show on. And a special guest will be making an appearance as well. So we're looking forward to that. And then, of course, November 7th, we're going to have to go another Sunday, only because I'm going back to Wisconsin to do some fishing. And uh, and Larry's going to join us. Uh, Larry was on the podcast a few weeks back, if you recall. Uh, Larry Mazer for uh, throwing Alabama rigs for smallmouth, for giant smallmouth. So he'll be joining us and going in-depth on the 7th. And then, of course, um, that'll be from my parents' basement, no doubt, from Wisconsin. And then we'll, we're actually shooting for the 22nd to have the group from Monster Bass on to kind of talk a little bit about their experience for the first time up on the St. Lawrence River. And then by that time, I'll have the whole video edited, so we might show some clips of that uh, on the 22nd. So it's going to be a big month here on the live. Just remember, the next two Sundays... And then we have a Monday after that, which will be the Patreon on the 15th. 
And then the 22nd, we'll have the Monster Bass guys on. So that's all I got. That is a awesome. lot, man. I know. I think that's you're it. Ready to get you into got it? Those, those hats yeah. on your website, right? Real quick. Yeah, Real man. Fun. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, uh, you know, if we got a few minutes, I got a few things that I'm going to be releasing on the Bass Lab site. Um, and, yeah, th thank you for putting that up. I appreciate it. So this is a Richardson 112 trucker hat. And, uh, man, I mean, it's it's one of the best. But I also got a beanie. This was one of the casualties of the trip. Uh oh. We we lost a beanie. I got a bloody hand. So I was wearing my beanie over, you know, like I wear the beanie. I'll take I'll take the things so off. Hold on. Let me see. I gotta get it set up, man. But anyway, it's uh it's a Dr. Duck uh dry, it's really soft, man, and it's waterproof. So I just kind of wear it like that, man. And I had taken it off because it got warm, and I placed it in Travis's seat, and Travis it totally reacts to everything in his seat. If there's any out of place and something that doesn't belong in his seat, <laughs> he's gonna say something about it. So I go, Travis, who's sitting on my beanie, is it still there? And like, he's like, no, man. And I'm like, where'd it go? I, go I think that spirit might have followed us, man. So we got a spirit on the Black River <laughs> oh, wearing a Bass man. Lab beanie, man. <laughs> uh, if somebody finds it, where does the St. Lawrence go? To the Atlantic Ocean. In the Atlantic Ocean now, that beanie could end up somewhere worldwide, man. I hope it goes all the way to Australia and Codfish and 180 gets it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, the beanies are on the site. The hats are on the site. And I'm actually having another hat made, uh, which is a retro trucker hat. It's a black camo. Uh, mm. So that's getting embroidered now. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll restock on the River Rat and Rise and Glide t-shirts will be coming soon. So, yeah, man, good stuff. And I've got some crankbaits I'm going to release on the website here. Let me just show them off for a second. If you would indulge me, Travis, do we still have time? Pretty stoked about these. Absolutely. So, so you guys will remember that when I released the June bug crankbait with TK at Tacklecraft on my first cast, I caught a smallmouth bass and then no other smallmouth after that. Nobody caught another smallmouth in that area. It was like that June bug crankbait had a destiny. So I've got some, I bought some Excalibur square bills a long, long time ago and colors that were off that I didn't really love. And I've been waiting for a time to paint them. So I've come up with a series of crankbaits and, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, rusty craws are pretty much taking over a lot of the native crawfish populations. They're an invasive species, they're a little more aggressive. So our little native crawfishes are now second to the rusty craw. So a rust, nothing, nothing super special about a rusty craw, but uh, this is a rusty craw pattern. It's olive green, black back, brown with a little bit of orange. And this is in a matte finish. So I threw this first cast rule was in effect and I caught a smallmouth bass lightning struck twice for me so thank you tk for nailing it so i'm going to sell these in a set of three in a rusty crawl and then i love this this is my color for early spring it's like a burnt black orange with a hot tip um when a lot of our crawls come out of the mud they are dark first thing in the season so this is a great early season square bill and then man i don't know why anybody hadn't done this before and done it well but this is he, he pulled it off for me a black and blue crawl as good as a black and blue jig is nobody's come out with a black and blue crawl pattern that i like but this one tk you nailed it brother wow, it's got gorgeous. and i like that that powder blue it's very understated these are matte finishes by the way the excalibur square bill in my opinion is Second to the Lucky Craft 1.5, the original, which you can't get anymore. The new Lucky Craft 1.5s don't do it for me. I don't know why. They feel different. We talked about some of the differences. But the Excalibur Square Bill, it has got an action that just gets bit. It's one of the best Square Bills ever made. So second to the Lucky Craft 1.5, which, you know, if you get an OG, they're going for about 40 bucks. So I'm going to mm -hmm. release these on the bass side. It, it'll come in, in a set of three. And uh, I did another round of minus ones. You guys have seen these colors before. I've got five colors and I added a powder blue. These are the OG double stamp minus ones. It's a great summer pattern. You know, powder blue back, chartreuse and a full orange belly. Uh, candy red crawl. Hot crawl. You got the ghost shad with that metallic flake on the top. And you got the blue crab. And then one more. Where is that thing? This is my copper truce gill. One of my favorite patterns, man. It's got a, a little bit of a blue bluish tint on the nose, copper shoulders, chartreuse belly with a hot hot spot of orange, and a little blue on the front there, man. Dynamite. So, mm. and, and I think I showed the blue crab. 
Alex, Which what one? are the odds he's going to set three of those aside for myself? I'd say they're pretty high. I know you Eric is so? definitely pretty generous with the gift baskets around here. All right. I, I hope so. Yeah, yeah they man. They look pretty good. They look they pretty do, good. For sure. And, the, and then the last thing from the 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 uh, mind of Marty Burns and Epic E, uh, I, um, I wanted a big body Chad bait. And I took the prototype down to Florida. He carved me three. This is the one I settled on. It's got a big rattle in it, and uh, it's his proprietary rattle. It sounds uh, different than any rattle I know of, uh, certainly in a production bait, but these are big body balsas. These are the Epic Shad. It's got, I don't know if you guys can see that, but it's got Bass Lab on the lip, which is pretty cool. Oh, that is cool. <laughs> I kind of like that. Yeah. And uh, so this is my Chartreuse Sexy Shad. It's got a little hint of gold on the shoulder. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, blue. Uh, it's got some of the nail polish that TK and I talked about, um, chartreuse, and then just a little bit of an orange throat. And then on the the, the white shad, um, it's got the uh, nail polish that I sent him with a with with blue, and then you know a white side and just a little hint of chartreuse on the belly. But uh, I took these down to Florida and I cranked and wormed it, Alex, actually on shell beds. <laughs> and uh, I got very big bites on on these baits. There's some pictures on, on my Instagram with the fish that I caught. It actually shocked Brent Anderson that I that came away and cranked as many up as I did. So I'm super stoked about throwing these early season on the Potomac, Upper Bay. I would be throwing these during the white perch run. Uh, it certainly Im imitates mm -hmm. a bigger shad, and uh, they're going to generate a bigger bite. This is a flat-sided bait, obviously. you've you, I don't know of any flat-sided bait in this shape um very very reminiscent of the bling 55 but this would be like a bling 100 so the bling gets bit and there's a story about marty and the bling 55 i'll tell it one night but uh i think the bling 55 is marty's design that was stolen by a california pro sent to japan and made but these baits have fish catching action so love them Th these are super limited release I, I i might not even put them up wow. or maybe i will i only have a handful so they're not going to be cheap. Um, they are what they are. It cost me a lot to buy them from Marty and send them to TK to paint. So, uh, but th these are big fish bite baits right here. So listen to the rattle. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that single ticker, old style. Anyway, that's that's what's going on at the Bass Lab, man. Thank you. Good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and guys, I'll try to put these up uh, tomorrow at eight o'clock. Uh, so that the people on the stream that, that tuned in to watch Travis and, and me and Alex and, and the guests that he has tonight and hear the stories uh, will, will know that they're going up. I'm not going to do a post until after I put them live. So it gives people that are tuning in to the lives first shot at these baits. And then I will post up later that night that I have them live on the website. So they'll go fast. The, the OG minus one sold out like instantly last time. So. Again, I, I don't. I only have a handful of lots to put up, so for sure, that's it. Well, listen, I'm excited for uh, the next portion of this program. Uh, we got some great guests coming up, Alex. I'm going to uh, pop you off, and then if you have, uh, if you want to monitor any questions that come up, and towards the end, we'll we'll bring you back and um, and, and and get to everybody's questions that they they may have. I know we have a lot of St. Croix Rod fans that are watching tonight, so. Um, I'm excited to get this thing started. Are you guys ready? Absolutely. Cool. All right, Alex. I appreciate it. Let's bring on who should we click on first here? We got <laughs> Dan and we got Ryan. Hi, guys. Gentlemen, how's it going? Good, good. Good to see you. Good to see you guys as well. Thanks for having us on. Man, I'm excited. We're trying to make this happen here for a little bit. We finally, uh, I know Dan likes to sit in the tree stand here pretty soon. So hopefully, <laughs> uh, hopefully we can, uh, I have a great show when it comes to when it comes to St. Croix rods, guys. I I've been using your products for years, and this was my first official year with you. And we've uh, I've been blown away with the product lineup because now I get to experiment with a lot of different uh, styles and and different rods that you actually make. And really, when you look into it, because I, I actually toured the uh, St. Croix store or, or the the plant actually back in I guess early spring late winter of last year mm -hmm. and uh was blown away i mean not only do they make some of the greatest bass rods out there but your whole lineup is crazy i i was using one of your salmon rods actually on the river 
uh, with Eric, but it goes much deeper than that. Anything and everything from Muskie to Panther. Actually, Eric and I remember the uh, the oh, Jumbo Perch episode. That was pretty darn good. The ultralights I mean, that you brought out were just like the finest. I, I love ultralight. I don't get to do it. I would like to do some of that on Big Smallmouth. Keep that in your head. Ah. Uh, oh, the spy bait rod they made. The sure. first time we're Travis get, cast it. Oh my gosh, there's so many stories. We're gonna get into that, but I just want to make a point here. There's something you guys know. I love the higher end stuff when it comes to all my equipment. And you know, I love the St. Croix legend extremes for bass fishing, but when you use an extreme for panfish, I mean, it's like, it's, Oh, that's right. I got the bass pro rod. Sorry. I, but I only not... had two Eric. Okay. I'm right. sorry. Well, you and Matt got the St. Croix and somehow did. I ended up with the, with the bass pro <laughs> shops rod. They were nice enough to let me actually feel it. Once I figured out you could use a piece of Mac scent to actually catch some jumbo perch. So anyway, so I, I, I got the upper hand by trying to be creative. <laughs> so <laughs> we oh, fought man. over it, by the way, we, we, we fought over it. We did. I said, I said, I gave it up for the pro on the boat, Matt Pangrag. I'm just a Joe. So, it so let's, so, so Dan, if you could start first, if you could just give us a quick background about yourself and, and your role at St. Croix and uh, kind of where you're at right now, actually, I think, I don't think you're, uh, are you at home or are you on the road traveling? I'm at home right now. Oh, okay. um, first of all, thanks for having us on. It's funny. I heard a, a paranormal story. My brother's a paranormal investigator. What? So I was kind of tuned in on this one an hour ago because that dark shadow in the ba in the background, man, <laughs> if I had my brother Scott on, he'd be all in on this deal. But So cool. Oh, oh, what the heck? Listen, man, he, he he's done like these, these haunted mansions from yeah. the 19 whatevers. And he's got oh, stories man. that would put the hair up on your back. And almost to the point where I hate to even go down that road because a lot of your listeners wouldn't believe me. <laughs> it's I'm cool stuff, but no, I've been on for, I've been with Croy for 23 years now. Wow. Um, and I love it. I'm our national sales manager now. Started out as a regional account manager, always been involved with our product side of things and um, just love the brand. You know, Travis, mm -hmm. to your point, it's hard to put a number or explain to people the value of Feeling what we mean by bumping a line, bumping the line with a stick bait, or feeling the uh, uh, fit any fish inhale the bait, or even push a bait where it just puts slack in your line. Being able to feel things like that on a rod with the technology that's out in lines right now is hard to explain until you actually do it. And I know you know what I'm saying because you do it with extreme, and mm -hmm. it it is something that we really pride ourselves on because we're really all about the angler, but. I got a lost rod story for you too. Okay, man. yeah. I, man, so when I was uh, a lot younger, my first boat I had was a Champion 174 with a Johnson Fast Strike on it. I was up in Northern Minnesota going across a lake called Big Sand. It was 40 foot of water. I heard you guys mention deep water trying to yeah. get a rod back. And I had about eight rods on the deck all pointing back and one of them comes blowing out. And I'm only about three quarters oh. throttle. And it goes out on me. So I'm like, oh. No, it was a Legend Elite 6.6 six light with a white Shimano Stratic on it. I'll never forget it, okay? So mm -hmm. I'm like, I told my brother, I'm like, that got pulled out. That didn't fly out. That got pulled out. So I'm like, I'll bet you that line got sucked off. It got to the knot, uh, and it pulled. So I spun around, got in my bubble wake about 100 yards back. I said, grab the longest flipping stick out of my rod locker. He went under the water. We grabbed the line and fed it out of 40 foot of water, and I got it back. Oh, wow. That is true oh. scout's honor, man. I, I've, wow. I've, I'll never have that happen again, but it was pretty cool. That's cool. So, yeah, you know, St. Croix is all about the uh, all about the angler, Travis, to really go back to your main point. We're, mm -hmm. That's what drives us, and we're fortunate because we have – you know, we're going on our 75th anniversary. We're family owned. It's all about passion and culture. And when you have complete control of the manufacturing process, we'll get into that. That's really rare. You'll never hear Ryan or I or anybody in our St. Croix family ever, ever disparage another brand. But I will tell you, a lot of rods really start at the 50 yard line with the blank. It is what it is. St. Croix builds the entire rod. Not only that, it has control over the mandrel, which is the foundation of the manufacturing mm. process. So we can get rods in your hands that really take things to the next level because we have total control over it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I definitely want to get into all that. But before we we go there, let's, uh, Ryan, if you could introduce yourself a little and a little bit of background as well. 
Yeah, you know, Dan one up me. I do not have any paranormal stories. Uh, I got some college stories where I thought I may have seen some ghosts, but I got, I got, I got nothing, nothing to one up, one up that one. Hey, man, I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, we, in this instance right here, we're known for bass rods, but I'm actually in Gulf Shores, Alabama right now on a photo shoot uh, and a test rod event. So normally I don't have this uh, white ghost bird behind me uh but i'm in a condo overlooking uh some oil rigs right out uh right out in the ocean here so uh this is my this is my fifth year with st croix so um i had a pretty corporate background and i wanted to work in the fishing industry and lo and behold i pestered enough people one of them dan uh to get me in contact with the right people and it just all all worked out so when st croix first hired me on uh to anybody listening tonight that is interested in a career in the fishing industry, uh, I can't say enough, uh, get involved in retail because St. Croix put me in our factory store. So I managed our factory store uh, for about a year and a half and got to know the ins and outs of retail. retail. And um, lo and behold, uh, an opportunity presented itself and, and I lead our product team now as our product manager. So uh, my, my main job at St. Croix is to listen. And I listen to uh, our anglers, I listen to feedback, I read reviews, I watch the Facebook forums, I don't post, but we watch all that feedback, we put all this stuff together, and we uh, we plan the next generation of sinker rods together. So in, in a nutshell, I manage a product from cradle to grave. So right now, uh, sitting right over there, there's a whole bunch of 2023 um, next generation rods that'll show up next year at ICAST. Um, hmm. But the, the greatest thing is, is uh you know as much as dan wants to talk about the the manufacturing process we got to talk about the next generation of victory rods that are going to show up here at some point in time which most definitely includes that spy bait rod that has been a bee in the bonnet for a long time for me so mm. it's fantastic i'm yeah. glad you guys had a great experience with it but we wow. did in fact it launches that bait man just a quick yeah. story i mean we're, we have no uh show notes here i mean let's just take the conversation wherever it goes but a lot of the viewers um, know I love the extremes. And so I I casted hair jigs with them. I've done it all from drop shot to finesse baits. And so the victory lineup was totally new to me. It was kind of, uh, it, it kind of was foreign because I only used extremes. Right. And so the first set of rods that I put to use in the spring um, was the, the two uh, victory rods, and I have them listed right here, and I believe uh, they're out there on the market. It's the uh, it was a seven one medium fast, and then the seven one medium heavy fast. Yep. And we started using those, especially on guide trips. Uh, that medium heavy. Uh, it, when I get a client that couldn't use a bait caster that well, and he needed a spinning rod. We started throwing chatter baits and swim jigs on that. And then I started actually using it more on Ned rigs, uh, the medium anyways, and was able to build some confidence with that and was really excited uh, because, of course, and I'd love to get into some of the production and some of the issues in the whole industry and what you guys, your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Uh, because that's affecting a lot of, uh, you know, everyone wants to get their hands on on all this cool product that nobody can anywhere. Uh but I was fortunate enough to get some of the other victory rods. And we threw that spy bait early in the season, Eric, you and I, uh, the spy bait rod, and was blown away with the distance and how it performed and just the way you could fight a fish with treble hooks and especially a smallmouth at close range with a long rod like that right next to the boat when you're going down to grab a fish or he's pulling away. Uh, it really handled those big smallmouth perfect. So when I got my hands on the hair jig, the crosshair, uh, and I just I made a video about a month ago uh, uh, with that rod, and guys, it has not been posted yet, but it will be. Us uh, again, uh, home run. But here's the coolest part. Now a hair jig typically for me is to be fished horizontally through the water calm, swimming it real slow. You know when that fish is going, you know, is hitting that bait, there was some situations where I had to throw that hair jig at a fish that I was seeing and not swim it. I had to dead stick it in front of him. And I could feel that bite with that particular rod. 
almost as well as I could with an extreme. And that was kind of mind blowing because I felt like I, I didn't lose any sensitivity with that rod, yet I'm able to now really effectively throw a hair jig rod so much better than I could in the past. Not only have I found that to be a good hair jig, and I'm talking 16, 332nd, 8th ounce, it also throws a small little swim bait amazingly. And and to fight that fish and bring it back on the swim bait, um, that rod will actually do, will be used quite a bit this year uh, with clients and with myself when it comes to swim bait fishing. I think, Eric, I handed you that rod last week, and you tried it out with a small swim bait too, and I think the results were the same in your mind as well. It's very good. Very good. Yeah, no, I think the uh, – I mean that spy bait rod is 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 a complete home run for sure. Yeah, I've never felt a rod just load so perfectly as it's been designed for the application. I mean it was just I don't know how you did it uh, because the first cast Travis made it, it went so far it went into a tree like I felt like it was a hundred yards away and both of us were like blown away like we were laughing and he so goes, we didn't put that I'm on like, camera but he did record it and he I made me keep it. I you think because be. that's like the whole point. We were right, both right. blown away with the distance. Like neither of us expected it because he's trying to hit in front of the tree to catch smallmouth. And I mean, it went to the next tree. It was ridiculously far. And it, you could just feel it load. And I mean, the taper that you put into it was was absolutely perfect for loading that light bait and throwing that treble and fighting the fish, as Travis mentioned. So bravo, man. And hey, and, and real quick, I'm sorry, I'm going down. No. Uh, but the uh, it's a VT73 <laughs> medium extra fast. Is the best jerk bait rod out there, hands down. <laughs> Just in my opinion. So everyone, in, so I'm seeing some questions. They all want to know when this is going to be available. Can we give them uh, an idea? Yeah. Dan, why don't you take that one? Yeah, guys, we had a we had what we called a great eight that we launched at the Bassmaster Classic last year. There's 25 models in the series in total, so there's 17 more coming out here November 1st. Um, and those are the models you're talking about there, uh, that are, yeah. And I agree that seven, three MLXF is just stupid. I'm throwing a little light wire Ned rig with it, with light fluorocarbon and to your point in terms of protecting light line with a big fish at the boat, it's just, it's like getting hung with on a big willow leaf, a big willow limb. You, they just don't get off. It's amazing. Yep. So, you know, so they're going to be available real soon, um, Great. for the angler out there. So we're sure, sure excited about it. The casting distance was a major part of both of those rods because we just got sick of, of not being able to cast past fish and bring baits past them. Um, mm. You know, using using whatever live sonar you want to. I mean, being able to spot fish and be able to get a bait, bait past them, and especially in a, a lot of the lakes in northern Wisconsin, our fishing pressure, like I'm sure a lot of guys can relate to, our fishing pressure has just exploded recently. So that ability to make long casts, stay back from fish, uh, has is really I don't want to say if it drove us to those rods. Honestly, frustration drove us to those rods. We just got sick and like putting a, a fighter fly and a chunk of Senko on the back and not being able to cast as far as we wanted to. And oh uh, yeah, and total credit. You know, I'm sure I know there's guys on my test team that are watching this tonight, but um, total credit, total credit to a lot of those guys. Dan's one of the members on our test team. Uh, Derek Hudnall, a lot of those guys. Um, we got those rods in their hands and we put them through the paces. I mean, mm. we we tested them to the expectations that they had going in that we had talked about as a team that we wanted to accomplish, we wanted to build them in park falls, uh, wanted a 15 year warranty. We had price ranges. We want to hit, uh, we wanted them light, wanted them sensitive, wanted all the above. Uh, but they had to continue to, to live and die by the standard that we talk about nearly in every product meeting. And, and that is, are we continually giving our angler the upper hand now? That is so, so important. And, and Dan, there's nobody better than you that can that can talk about that. Well, it's why we exist, guys. I mean, if you look at our exist statement that we came up with a few, few years ago, and I'll regurgitate it, it's we exist to provide every angler the upper hand. It's on our marketing. It's been on our billboard in front of our factory. It's all over the place. And it's true. It, it's, you know, and we're, we're, to be honest with you, without making Ryan blush, we're blessed to have him. Not only is he a fishing, he's really a bass head, but he's a great listener. And that's so important because, you know, to, to back to victory, one of the things that a few of us really wanted was a slightly longer foregrip in front of the reel for on the spinning side from 
in Travis, you'd, you'd know, both you guys would know, you get a four pound smallmouth pinned on the end of a cast way out. Leverage is, is a factor. Those mm-hmm. things are like hooking the Tasmanian devil. They fight harder <laughs> than green. They fight harder than green ones. And we both know it. And it's not just oh, at the boat. Back. So back. It, it leverage was important, but uh, you know, the handle diameters and the length of the foregrip and the, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to, to Ryan. I, I give a lot of credit to uh, a lot of the people on our team and certainly our engineers and in production, again, having control over what we do guys is, is so critical. Do we get it right every time? Absolutely not. You know, but we have a chance to get it right because we have control over it. You know, and it sounds like this spy bait rod's the real deal. And um, it's sure exciting to hear you guys talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, there's been uh, there's been a bunch in the victory lineup that that I love. You know, the the frog rod on the bait casting side. I guess you call it the full contact. That's the one I. Yeah. So I've been, I've been in that situation where I'm kind of experimenting this year with the different victory rods and trying to find different applications. And so, uh, I don't know if now's a good time to do that, but I had a, I have a couple questions of my Where's own, it, man, uh, for you. Uh, one being, and then we have to talk about the legend glass, of course, but. The uh, the victory rod. Oh, I'm trying to find it here. So I guess we call it the um, the flipping the uh, the seven five medium heavy fast. Yeah. So I sounds like it's designed for flipping jigs and Texas rig, but I'm using it as a, a, a whopper plopper and like a spook bait. Is that Am I, am I on it? You, you are doing the exact right thing. And the thing is, is so when we put these names on, on the rods, on the projects, uh, full contact finesse was the first name that came out the 73 heavy extra fast rod. Mm -hmm. Um, the flipping rod, uh, that's what it was originally brought to the market or or that was our thought process behind it is we wanted, wanted to be able to have a light duty flipping rod that you could actively present something like a crawfather or a missile crawl or something like that. And the light, light application the mississippi river up by us uh there's some absolutely deadly times in the year of flipping cut banks with the lightest weight you can but if Mm. you're trying to use a standard issue flipping rod you got way too much tip and you end up putting in the weeds or you ended up you you just don't operate correctly but travis that is the sleeper rod of this i don't want to say the entire lineup because there's a lot of great applications that people are going to find that we didn't see but uh i'm using that rod uh to throw a I'm throwing a Kitek on it. I'm throwing a Whopper Plopper on it. Uh, yeah. It's a fantastic Carolina rig rod, which sometimes gets overshadowed. It's not the cool thing oh, to talk yeah. about right now. Very but true. It's, yeah, it's a great ball and chain rod. Uh, that mm. that name is one where, from the product management side, I'm like, man, if I could have that one back, you know, to, gotcha. to change sure. the change the name on it. Um, <laughs> the uh, 73 heavy moderate fast. Uh, it it came up that, and it came as news to news to me. It's like you're missing out if you're only flipping with that rod. You need to be throwing a chatterbait and heavy cover with it because the ability to rip the chatterbait out of grass. That's it's a great application for that one too. Uh, you know, a uh, Okshira spinhead uh, on a or a, or a Roadrunner on the 70, 710 medium moderate fast on the spy bait rod. You know, mm-hmm. there's these great applications, and that's that, I think yeah. that's one of the coolest thing about bass fishermen is that we look at, we listen to information, we synthesize it. And then we make our own decisions. We we go out and we forge forward and we're like, yeah, I, maybe maybe you're saying that's flipping, but I'm going to throw a whopper plopper on it, you know? And then as oh, a bass yeah. guy, you know, everybody's, everybody can agree. We've, we've all made mistakes of purchasing some stuff. We're like, man, what did I, what did I buy that for? But, <laughs> for you sure. know, everybody makes those mistakes. Flying lure, you know, or banjo. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on. I still <laughs> got a couple Whoa, of those. Hey, you know, why, that might be a crazy crazy video bass, coming you know? up. So the great thing is, the is <laughs> exactly. I invite uh, everybody to get into a retailer, get online, talk amongst yourselves, but there's going to be, these names were names for the projects of the rods and don't let them deter you from going out and, and figuring out something that we didn't. And trust me, we want to hear about it. Hey, Travis, mm-hmm. this is a great idea. I, I, you know, to me, what you just talked about was the multi-application rod. There's a legion of co-anglers out there because I generally travel around on other people's boats. My team partner, Scooter Lily in North Carolina, he fishes fresh and salt, but I'm on, you know, big green head lakes with him. I'm up north with Travis. So I'm usually seven to eight rods. I took eight rods on this trip. 
with Travis the Monster Bass. So it was three spinning rods. He let me finally use a victory. Oh, I'm sorry. And, no, the Legend Extreme. He put one in my hand, and I okay. caught the last big fish of the day to go in our well for the victory yep. day two. So that was awesome yeah. on a uh, yeah man on a on a on a, on a Z Man minnow. So um, I would love to see like the the lucky seven co angler lineup. And then show the rod model in all the applications. One rod, four baits. One rod, wow. three baits. You know, and 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 Travis, I'd like to that's fish actually them. a great so, uh, well, video I'd, I'd idea. I'd like Eric. I'd like to fish them. You don't yeah. get to fish them. You use your stuff. I want the <laughs> okay. seven from yeah. Saint Croix, designed by these two, or the the existing ones in the lineup. And sure. let's go. I want that to throw a plopper, a buzz bait. I, I want yep. to throw a walking bait on that multi-purpose rod, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it can be done because I'll throw a leader uh, on braided line. So if I have braid on it, I can throw a lot of different things and put a braided leader on it. I mean, a fluorocarbon leader or a mono leader mm -hmm. on some of the walking baits. And, and it works out good for me. People freak out that I've got a, a braid to mono 20-pound big game connection on a buzz bait. But if you tie the knot good, man, you can fish it all day and not worry, and it will put fish in the boat, especially if you've got the right action rod. So I'd love to see the seven from St. Croix for the co-angler in a package, and I'll fish them with Travis. That'd got it. Awesome. That's, a, that's a great thing. Thanks. You pretty much uh, teed that one up for us. Yeah, I can take care of that. No no problem. Dan, yeah. I'm Dan, try. You got to tell these guys what you're throwing your chatterbait on. Okay. So right now – um, I hope I'm right with this. I really love the uh, the Legend Glass, the seven two. Uh, is it the heavy moderate? Yeah. I I don't think there's a better chatterbait rod out there except the Mojo Bass seven two heavy moderate. I think is almost identical. It feels almost identical to me when it, when I'm. So I use that one. For burning a one ounce spinner bait for smallmouth, uh, you know, just open water. It, it allows me to make a really long cast. That rod loads up that bait, chucks it out there. Maybe there's a better rod for that application, but I do like it. But then the Legend Glass for chatter baiting is is that's my go to rod, and I wouldn't have used it except the gentleman that bought my boat last year. Uh, when I was getting all these legend glass rods, I was talking to him about it and he goes, well, you better have ordered some of those and try it on a chatterbait. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I, I will. Because originally, I mean, it makes a, it's a very good square bill rod as well for heavy cover. But, um, I don't know. What, what were your thoughts? Is that, is that the uh, direction you, you thought I would go with that? Oh, Ryan, do you want me to go or oh, yeah, man, you're, you're in deep on this guy. Well, okay. it depends on the, for me, I, I, it depends on the line. I'm a big Ryan and I go back and forth on this all the time. I'm a big 20 pound floor guy with chatterbait. Cause I think the bait hunts different than braid. That's my opinion. Um, but I also use different blades and different heads and sizes. I was lucky enough to get the little Z man mini max mm. early. And I practiced with it for a tournament this fall. And I'm telling you right now, the, 72 MHM carbon rod with that bait is stupid good. Oh. I mean, so good that it makes it made me better than I am with a bladed jig in terms of not having to kick start it. It starts on one handle of the crank at turn of the crank. It it's literally landing like a wet leaf where I put it in there. I don't think I missed one in practice with it. Which um, model was that? 72 MHM carbon. But again, guys, that's a little tiny bladed jig. That's that, you know, that's the new mini max they're just coming out with. So it's an apples and oranges compared to what you're talking about, Travis, with the one ounce bait. But right. it is unbelievable uh, for that. Now, for the for a standard jackhammer half ounce, uh, I will throw glass a lot. I love the rod you're talking about. I think it's absolutely I think they just get it. Uh, they don't get off. Um, I kind of get out on my own way. I don't jerk on them too quick. You guys know that blade on that bladed jig can almost act as a deflector. The rod's too stiff and you can miss them. So oh, yeah. I, 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 but it's, but it depends on the line for me. If I'm fishing grass, my whole game changes because I'm having to rip it and braid rips way out of grass better than floral. So mm. I got a couple rods I'm throwing, generally speaking, one's an MHM and then one's the HM glass. The MHM's in carbon. Okay. Completely different setup. I mean, early season, 
shorter grass. Totally. And people people will put down the chatterbait, you know, as that grass gets thicker. Big mistake. Let's totally. look at this guy with the braid, man. They eat it and continue to eat it. For sure. Yep. For sure. Heck yeah, yeah there's, man. There's been, you know, as far as all the glass, whether it be the uh the seven two or the seven four, the seven four I'm using more for a little bit larger crankbait, like a DT ten. Uh, we actually threw what was that? Uh, the Demiki three hundred, Eric on Champlain last week. Yeah, yeah, the right? ones that ride sideways. They had to tune them like crazy. Right. Twenty mile an hour wind. <laughs> oh my gosh! But Can't we... they just come out of the pack, man? Running straight. <laughs> oh, I don't get that. That's so true. Brian oh, Thrift, man. why did you do that? To us? <laughs> <laughs> no, but the color, the color was the right color. It's a nice yeah. looking bait, but it anyways, bait. once anyway. you could get them to run right. Yeah, uh, it seemed like that rod really was able to handle that bait, and hundred um, percent. Your your cranking rods are awesome, man. I'm mm -hmm. so happy to see a glass rod come back. Uh, it's uh, it's 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 pretty cool, man. I'd love to rig one up one time and try it. I'm a, I'm a lefty, and Travis is a righty, so I I bait cast goofy foot like skateboarders, <laughs> but uh, so I can't fish his gear. I have to grab a rod, and right. he's kind of protective of the St. <laughs> Croix lineup he's got. He'll hand me one every once in a while, but that's all right. No, I love that cranking rod, though. It, it's got. It seems like it has extraordinary action. So, the there's another victory rod. If you guys, if you love those cranking rods, I'm going to steer you into complete opposite end of the spectrum. Okay, uh, we have a fantastic group of guys that were really involved with the uh, 710 XHM. So that's a 710 casting rod, extra heavy, moderate. We have a fantastic group of guys that Dan has connected us with down in the Ozarks. And these guys uh, can put an 8XD and a 10XD to the test. Um, and if you can pass their test, uh, <laughs> you, you can get you can pat yourself on the back because sure. those guys are pretty hard to impress. But don't, uh, don't overlook that rod. Um, it is a carbon rod, uh, but it's super light. And that was that was another one of those rods. We just... We wanted mm. to build a dedicated 8XD or a 10XD rod. Um, wow. And and really, uh, the thought process came from the beginning. Um, uh, Dan kind of leaned the charge on it is that you can't have a rod when you're cranking a 10XD that's completely maxed out. It just doesn't work. So when the fish grabs it, uh, you, you it's got nothing left to grab. You know, <laughs> you're so into cranking when the when the fish grabs on. If it if it's pulling all you got left in your rod tip, you're you're chances of getting that fish especially in cold water are going to be difficult so we worked yeah, on over time was looking at dd22 uh the big mm. z boss uh 10xd 8xd and having that rod load 40 percent of the time when you're cranking down and then having the ability for the fish to come up grab onto the crankbait's rear end and have some left so you can you can get back into them yeah and what a lot of people don't ryan that you nailed that I, you know what a lot of people don't understand with a Z-Boss 20 or a DD-22 or 10XD or anything, um, is they're throwing light line on them, guys. I mean, 12-pound fluoro. Mm -hmm. And the reason is you, you want to throw it a mile. You want to be able to feel the cadence of the bait, but most importantly, when it goes out of cadence. And when that bite, a lot of times it's a push of water or something that's just wrong. It's just not quite right. And that ropey, heavy line works against you. And that's what I'm really proud of the way these things turned out. I, I mean, they're – they're kind of one of those must haves in the box, at least down in uh, where I live. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, real quick, couple questions I want to get to because we're, I, I see we're missing a bunch of them as we, as we're talking here. Uh, Sean wants to know the difference between the Mojo and the legend glass. Cause I kind of mentioned, I felt like that one Mojo was very similar to the, uh, the one I was using for chatterbaits. Uh, can you kind of explain the, the differences there? Ryan, you want to take that? You want me to do either way? Hey, why don't you do it? You, you, you yeah, you know, well. Sean, it's a great question. And Mojo Bass Glass and Legend Glass actually use the same blank. They're both SC1 Linear S Glass. And one thing about Linear S Glass that St. Croix's done for the first time ever is we've manufactured on St. Croix's IPC tooling. And I would just ask you guys to research that off to the side. I don't want to get terribly weedy, but it's a, it's a mandrel technology that we use exclusively. And when I talked about having vertical control guys, this epitomizes that because it's the best mandrel technology out there in the rod building industry. And we build it on, on SC1 linear S glass. That's what makes 
mojo bass glass and legend glass so bad to the bone it's finally a glass rod that's got feel that's relatively light that loads up but it pins them they don't get off you can feel the bait i could go on and on and a, a lot of it's the material but certainly it's part of the manufacturing too but the big difference between those two one's made in our st croix north facility in park falls which is the largest rod manufacturing facility in the u.s and then mojo bass is made in our st croix south facility in fresno mexico you have uh, SIC guides on the legend glass. So you got your component trees a little higher end. Okay. But in terms of the way that they, they fish, you know, and some people love the color of legend glass too. I mean, is it, it's, it's hard. Some of my old glass rods were e-glass back in my twenties. I used to, man, I, I, I used some things that I fished back then that I, I can't believe when I compare to, to what I have in my hands now. But uh, I mean, I'd have to have somebody, something take my arm off in order to get a, to feel that it was something stretching me on the other end. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? But, you know, oh, there's yeah. a lot of similarities to Mojo and Legend. Uh, the blanks are the same, uh, the lengths, powers, and actions. Uh, so it's componentry and uh, uh, where it's manufactured. Yeah, I got Perfect. some glass rods right over there that I could bring out that you'd be going, what? There's, there's some good ones in there, Matt. Yeah. They are. Yeah, so, but they're old and they're nothing like what's out today. But Yeah, that's cool E-glass cool versus that. S-glass, guys. Oh, yeah. I mean, E-glass was a different, completely different makeup of glass fibers, and it was clunkier. It did deflect what we call moderately, so way down into the blank. So the fish did get it when they inhaled it, but you couldn't feel anything with it. Where if you <laughs> if you fish the Legend or Mojo Bass glass rods, it's amazing. I remember the first bait I ever threw when I was testing Legend glass was a DT6 on our 7.2 mm, and I couldn't believe it. What, I couldn't believe it. What I, I could actually feel the cadence of the bait wow. with a DT6 and a glass rod, and that was really cool. That's breakthrough. Yeah. I, I, I started using glass when I first got into bass fishing because I really just through my research, and there's a debate out there fiberglass, you know, uh, versus graphite or whatever the case may be. And I, I just or blended or blended, right? Like a, like a composite. So there's three. You could talk about three. True. And yeah. I just went, I just felt for my style and what I read uh, to go with fiberglass. And I, I haven't looked back, you know, I've, I've been, I've been happy with, with the performance. And I, I feel like I have a better, I think it comes down to confidence. I know there's guys that are saying, you know, a blend or, or whatever the case may be, they have, they have more confidence in that style, depending on how they fish and, the type of line they use and you know we can get into braid versus mono versus fluorocarbon when it comes to cranking but for my style i'm really pleased with the way that holds a fish and and pins it and i know they're heavier but uh i i just i'd prefer to to catch a fish than to to lose a fish on a crankbait if you know what i mean i'm just confident with that yeah. with that style mm -hmm. yeah. so we have another question i i want to get into this one um, grad 84 goes, he wanted, I think I missed, he wanted a rundown of the extremes versus like the X series and kind of the differences. Now we're kind of talking, comparing different rods here in the St. Croix lineup. Can you give us a little, uh, education on that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll take, I'll take that one. So the biggest difference between legend X and legend extreme is, is obviously the handle right off the bat. So that handle, um, it's one of the few places in our manufacturing facility that when you come up and take a tour and want to see the whole thing, you can't see where that handle's being made. Um, it's, it's a room that it's, it's one of our processes takes, uh, an extended amount of time to make that. Some people are like, well, it's plastic. It's like, no, it's not a plastic handle. Um, it's, it's a process that takes an extended period of time. And that's what I'll, that's what I'll add. Uh, in the last generation, um, it did not have extreme skin. In the newest generation, it's got extreme skin, which is a uh, grip type material that we apply uh, basically by hand. So each one of them has kind of their own own pattern to it, um, uh, to our standard when it gets passed and gets, go, gets to go into circulation. That's one of the biggest things that you'll see. The other thing is uh, the carbon fiber guides on legend extreme versus torzites on legend x those are those are the big things uh sc5 construction both blanks um, much wider away array of rods in legend x uh smaller 
little smaller grouping of rods in that Legend Extreme lineup. Most notably, uh, two rods that were just released at ICAST this year, which is the 7.3 Medium Light Extra Fast, really targeted towards um, dead rig guys. Um, people, I, I know some people are fishing a drop shot on it, but that series is our most sensitive series we've ever built. Um, just the way the handle, the, the properties of the handle and how it's manufactured really transmits vibration, which is us feeling the bottom really, mm -hmm. really well. And then there's also a rod that was released at ICAST, the 7.6, medium, heavy, moderate, fast, which is turning into super good Carolina rig rod, uh, football jig rod. I know some people are throwing swim baits on it, but um, to be able to throw out at a long distance away and literally count rocks as you bring the bait back to you with that football jig. Um, and, and the thing that blew me away about Legend Extreme the first time I fished it was fishing transition lines so fishing sand to gravel and mm. definitively knowing that i am fishing that vein and mm. and that sometimes it matters sometimes they don't care but <laughs> um, for the times it matters it's it's nice to have that tool um available to you sure we were doing a lot of that drifting with the football jig and trying to count the rocks and it was an interesting experience. I I would have. Do you have that rod, Travis, or is that a new one? He's talking about coming out in the most sensitive. Um, well, for, uh, Saint Croix. The one I use right now, currently, uh, yeah. uh, in the extreme lineup with a on the baitcaster would be the seven foot medium heavy, um, sure. fast action. That's the one I use for my football for dragging a football for small. Right model. on. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I didn't know if they were coming out with a seven, three or a seven, six longer for, you know, longer casting application, but you're, you're talking about a, a, a rod line. That is your most sensitive yep. rod to date. That's yeah, that, pretty that's exciting. You're extreme. upping your, that's cool. You got it. And then you'll be able to, so the commitment we made to our anglers is that legend extreme would come out with a smaller offering offering, and then we'd add extra rods as time went on. And then two rods got added at ICAST. Those rods also will be available 11 one, and that's the 7.3 medium light extra fast spinning rod and the 7.6 uh, medium heavy uh, moderate fast casting what, rod. What so was the first oh, one? What was the first Travis, one? You got to get those, Travis. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks for telling me. I tend to talk like, like an auctioneer. Uh, when I get uh, that uh, a uh, half a dozen on. each, Travis. You need <laughs> both those rods. I want Hold six on. of those each. <laughs> 7.3 medium light extra fast. Ah. Yes. Hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yep. Two, please. Where am I going to put all these rods, Eric? In my truck. I'll I mean, for you. Don't even worry about it. I got you, man. I and only then, bring eight, so I got a lot of room. I am a, it, li I'm living, breathing proof that you can put 45 rods in uh, in the uh, left side rod locker of a Bass Cat era, which is only meant to hold what? Oh, the Bass Cat's oh, like, ah, oh, 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 put 15 in there. No way. No, holy doesn't holy. Work. We That's try. Incredible. We try. Uh, changing it up a little bit, I have a quick story, and then I want to, I want to see if uh, – and hopefully, Eric, you can – answer this what model you were using but back in august you brought a saint croix rod out drop shotting and you mentioned that they don't make that one anymore or i don't know the backstory on that but um oh yeah what was that oh one? my god i have to go get it do you I know, don't know. It? oh danny, yeah dude Dan, danny corriere used to use it uh the guy with the thick accent is who's the guy up in new hampshire he was a pro know. And he was drop shot when I'm like, and I rolled up to a tackle shop. It's called Tackerman's in East or Baltimore. And they carried St. Croix. And I'm looking, I'm like, oh man, I got to have that rod because it had a graphite handle or, or some odd handle. Let me sure. go get the rod. Okay. So that we could just so was the, cool. was the handle Brown. Yes. Yeah. Wow. It was a legend elite. We used yep. legend elite. We used to make a, uh, handle that had the, it was kind of a marbled brown that's it that's yep. it that's yeah that was that was quite that a few years ago yep. so, oh that so is that, a great drop shot rod man so i've awesome. fished with eric for years and i've never seen this rod and this and this day he brings it out he's like man this is a this is a good drop shot rod and um like, yeah. well, what the hell is that he's like it's a saint croix i'm like no it is not nah, hey, hey guys about? so just a heads up that handle that's the nps real seat yeah and that that handle now is available on bass x which is a um, an, a, par, a price point where most bass anglers find us. Um, that was just released at ICAST. So That's so crazy. Keep keep, uh, keep your eyes out. Those two will be available eleven one. So we that, that technology was once at a, a five hundred dollar price point, and that handle now it's at the Bass X price point, which is a uh, you know at that one hundred and 
thirty to one hundred fifty dollar price point. How about that? That's crazy, man. But yeah. I absolutely love using that rod. I was up on Ontario with Travis, and it performed extremely well in drop side situations. I mean, it cast a mile. It has a tip to let them eat the bait. I felt like the fish when they were near the boat, no problem. Go ahead, struggle all you want. You're on a willow, you know, branch. You're not getting off, <laughs> right? And yet I was testing out a new drop shot hook, which is not the normal drop shot hook that I normally use. It was uh, slightly different so travis is going to test it in wisconsin and report back i will give it, it a try could, it could be on a new episode of smallmouth crush stay we're tuned everybody. we're going to see if eric's going to change my mind when it comes to uh the perfect drop shot hook i'm i'm listening i'm listening ah, it has my attention i didn't Gosh. lose any fish with him and, and that's you know i can't always say that when i'm fishing with travis that i don't lose any fish it's you know smallmouth are nutty mm -hmm. they, they freaking jump off man right what are right. you gonna do <laughs> nightmares oh yeah so as far wow. as uh Good stuff shortages and things like that in the industry do you feel like as a company uh you're making progress there or what does the future show uh when it comes to your company and what do you see in the industry as a whole as well the uh that that is man don't talk weeds that's a weedy that's a yeah. weedy one the um the greatest thing for us is what dan touched on is that we can control so much of our manufacturing process and and our job every day is to continue to control it. Um, that means making plans and forecasting correctly and using our manufacturing resources as efficiently as possible. Uh, the other part of that is, though, is there's some things that we you can't control. Um, and unfortunately for us, we're not to the point yet where we can control those things. doesn't mean we're not working on it, but uh, we're not to the point where we can control them. The... The unique thing is that there's a lot more people fishing right now than there ever has been. We all know that. I mean, it's pretty obvious when you go to a ramp. Um, the great thing is, is that those uh, those excise tax dollars, and if you don't know what, haven't uh, heard what those are, those excise tax dollars are very important to us as an angling base as a whole. And to see that fishing base grow in licenses and buying rods. So when somebody buys one of our rods, we we as a company pay an excise tax and that's to, to support our fisheries. So the easy way to say is, you know, you can curse the supply chain and curse what has happened in the last couple of years, but it's kind of a perfect storm of fishing, really picking up people getting interested in it and manufacturers meet or met or reaching that demand you know it would have been easy for us when we saw demand go really high to be like okay we're just going to throw a bunch of resources at it and we're going to build a bunch of rods but that's not really how st croix works we don't ever sacrifice quantity um or like sacrifice quality just to put a bunch of rods out there so it takes time to train people that line guides on it takes time to train all of these craftsmen and women that work and our St. Croix North facility and our St. Croix South facility to be able to produce these rods. So speaking just in regards to our shortages, mm -hmm. we are, we're making, we're putting the right pieces in place to be able to uh, hit those inventory levels that uh, is expected of us. I know a lot of people go to our St. Croix website and you look at it and you're like, well, they're out of stock. Everything. Everything's sold out. Yes. It's not the case. What people don't understand is that we take care of our retailers first sure. before you ever see rods and in inventory there. So what we're doing yeah. is we're listening to independents. We're listening to big box retailers. We're keeping those folks with rods and in inventory because they have, they have a payroll to play, pay. They have rent to pay. They have a customer base to take care of and we can we'll just not put them as available on our website so don't use our website as a gauge if we have inventory or if we're you know gotcha. just all out fishing in park falls and not not building rods dan <laughs> dan you can probably go into this in much more detail because you you deal with this every day well it's global supply chain issues combined with unprecedented demand on the fishing side you know, we have demand on St. Croix rods that we've never had before. And part of that is um, eight to 10 million anglers, according to the American Sport Fishing, Sport Fishing Association, getting into the sport last year. Wow. And there's a little bit of a buy North America thing going on too, guys. I mean, it's a Bravo. feel good thing. And right. You so support, roll up your sleeves, Northern Wisconsin, the 32 sets of passionate hands that build every St. Croix rod. There's, little bit of that going on too. 
Yeah, but to cool. Ryan's point, we're never going to compromise quality for quantity, and um, we're doing the best we can and and to try to get the rods out to the anglers. It's getting a little bit better, but one thing that surprises even me is our national sales managers. This demand isn't slowing down. I mean, so, we're, we're it's amazing how people are still incredibly enthusiastic about anything outdoors, whether it's a kayak or even when I go shoot my bow now, there's five guys at the range. And last year there'd be two years ago, there'd be two, you know, so people are just out doing it. Did you, did you just say there are eight to 10 million new anglers? And because people are, I guess, working from home, they had to discover the outdoors. I mean, I've got a place in Western Maryland and I've never seen the number of people I saw on the lake because they're working from home, which means they can work from anywhere. It's it's mm -hmm. it's eaten up all the lakefront property and off lake property. And now they're all outdoor enthusiasts. I see paddle boarders out there, kayakers out there. They're fishing in May. Literally, I'd go up there in May. I, there, there would be nobody on the water but me. It was great. And now there's 20 people. Uh, mm -hmm. And this lake has 63 miles of shoreline. It's not a small lake. I'm just well, talking about in my cove. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think part of that is back when the big COVID thing really kicked in, there wasn't really a better example of social distancing than being on my 22 foot ranger and out there by right myself. On. Sure. Fishing, right. Sure. So so I think part of it was social distancing. But then yeah. and I was asked on a podcast a while back what our biggest responsibility is as stewards of this industry yeah. in keeping these eight to 10 million anglers fishing. And my answer is pretty simple is let's help them be successful. And I, you know, whether that's you guys doing what you're doing here, Travis, or yeah. the listeners out there that are listening to you that may learn something, it'll tell their buddy, that'll tell their buddy. I mean, you're doing a great service and, and I really, really commend you for what you're doing. And I, I, I think it's on all of us that not only have fished all our lives, but are in a position to where we can touch a lot of potential anglers to help them be successful. So if it's 100%. teaching them how to tie a palomar knot or yeah. when, when to use a snap and when not to, and when to use a high gear ratio reel and when not to. And sometimes yeah, yeah. it's the little things that can make all the difference. And I think oh it's on God. us to make sure we do that. Yeah. Nah, great, great point, man. Be good stewards of the environment and, you know, fishing education and, stoking passions and firing people up that have you know there were people on the monster bass trip that had never caught a smallmouth i promise yeah. you they are stoked now their lives right. are changed <laughs> sure. they can to see their marketing manager named rafi who never probably fished before let alone caught a smallmouth stay with it on day two of the tournament series he was fishing till the last minute till we said lines out. You could see him shaking that net back there. And both me and Travis like hit each other like, check out Rafi, man. He's fishing till the very end. He is, he's got the bug. There's no better feeling than seeing somebody who's had a bad week, a bad month, a bad day. You take them out on the water and they just disconnect from all the noise in America and on the planet. And their worries and troubles melt away, and they are just at one with nature, the water, the rod, the reel, and the right gear and the right education makes all the difference in the world, man. Truly. Yeah, yeah you, no. you, you totally, totally just nailed that. And and sometimes another thing I try to try to pass along to make sure that and I would say this to you too, and I'd certainly say it to Ryan and anybody that. I, a buddy of mine texted me who's watching it, watching in right now and said, this is really cool. And he fishes named John Bala fishes at a very, very high level. And mm -hmm. I think it's on us to make sure that we remember that a lot of these people are just getting in the sport. So when we get to talking about, you know, something sure. we, we need to slow down and remember that oh, it was yeah. the most basic things that made us successful when we started. And even though we're learning every day ourselves, obviously. But sure. when we're talking to an entry-level angler, some of these people don't understand what a improved clinch knot is. So right. slow down and teach them how to tie it. Show them the importance of wetting it. Uh, oh. Just the little things that, that are so important. And I, I really think it's our responsibility, you know, right oh, now man. to do that, to help people catch them. Mm. Spot on, man. I mean, you know, where we, we were fishing with Rick from Monster Bass and he, he's a power fisherman. He wants a bait caster. 
in his hand and Travis gave him the spinning rod because it was a Ned rig bite or a drop shot or dragging a jig and current. And that was too difficult. So Travis opted for these clean bare spots on grass edges and you know, the lights out, you can't really see the edge. You could see a little watercolor change and to point a few things out to Rick, he ended up with three of the big bass in the well day one because Travis sure. kept him throwing that Z man minnow Z a little bit bigger bait, a little heavier head so he could feel he didn't overwork the bait. You know, I gave him some instruction. Travis was giving him instruction. But to see him hook up and the pride that he had yes. with, you know, smallmouth crush on the front, you know, he's taught me a lot about smallmouth fishing. Travis has, and, you know, to see him end up with three of our fish in the well for 2474 was pretty exciting. And then day two was a different story. Travis is like, I'm smallmouth crush. I'm beating everybody today <laughs> on my own. So he's locked on to the scope, right? And I'm like, go to work, brother. Go to work. Let's get the W. It's time right? to defend the title. And so Travis, and, you know, he's kept, I caught an early fish. It was four or something. It went in the well. That was dragging a jig. And Travis is in heavy current. And that Rick cast his rod in first cast. Did you guys hear that before you got on the show? I did. That's, yeah. <laughs> so so we, we almost lost two Legends Extreme spinning rods in two days or, or in a week. Literally, I watch him hit the deck. I see it out of the corner of my eye. The rod goes straight in the water. He hits the deck like a commando and, and knifes in the water and grabs it. But he's wet, so he's out of the game. We're in heavy current. He's totally out of the game. His hands are cold. So Travis and I put some fish in the well, and then we get into the grass again. It's lower wind. The lights are on. We're seeing fish. They're a little bit spooky. And Travis has got it dialed in. He is going to work. He's not paying attention to anybody. Don't ask him for anything. He's laser focused. He's going to get us the W. And uh, Rick at 1 o'clock did not have a fish. And you could see his emotions going, I'm out of the game. And so uh, I kind of nudge Travis and I go, Travis, uh, one of your sponsors kind of needs a fish right now. He goes, <laughs> he goes, we're going. So, man, he powers like 20 miles up river and puts him on five small mouth and nine casts. And he is re-energized. And he really taught him out of the wind, out of the heavy current, how to throw a Ned rig. And I promise you, he will remember how to throw a Ned rig in slower current for the rest of his life. He's got it dialed in because Travis saw the bite before he did, you know, Travis is telling the angles and the line on, you know, it was a particular area where there's a ledge and you got to drop it off. Let the bait sink, you know, don't move it too much slowly because he's overworking the rod tip. Great instructor. And uh, he was just re-energized. He's back in the game. So then we jet back down to where the bigger fish are and continue the, uh, and that was the last fish he caught. So, but it was pretty awesome awesome day we got the w so it was a story. good time totally. uh nate in the comments goes what's the best st croix jerkbait rod or most popular and the one i use nate would be uh the victory it's called the jerk um six eight interesting medium extra fast right on well for again you know you know this one thing that's really fun about tonight is we we can get super weedy and this is like awesome I, it's right. so cool so i would say cold water 10 pound fluorocarbon uh like mega bass 110 size there's a bunch of jerk baits out there but that general size absolutely unquestionably yes 100 okay. percent. and part of that's because obviously we know the fish are the temperature of the water and that rod seems to work that bait pretty lazily compared to us a, a, a rod that's too fast because a lot of people out there are thinking, well, what does he mean by that? This is an extra fast. But what people need to understand is an extra fast in some cases has a softer tip than a fast. It's just bends closer to it. OK, so that's important to understand. And not only does it work that that 110 size bait or even the Lucky Craft baits or anything with the right cadence, but they just don't get off with that tip now when we're starting to fish something with a little faster cadence, like we'll fish a rattling rogue or something and the water warms up where we're sticking it six, seven times in a row, brief pause, stick, stick, totally different than soaking it for 20 seconds. Okay. Mm. Then we'll use a little bit stiffer rod, little bit heavier line. And, and sometimes I'll throw that on a medium fast, which actually has a little bit heavier feeling tip than the medium mm extra fast in terms of the way it feels and protects the line and fishes the bait. So, but I agree with you hundred percent. If you're looking for one jerk bait rod, 
Um, that 6.8 MXF, if you're going to get one out there. Now, granted, when we get down into like pointer 78 sizes, that's a okay. totally different animal. But so, Travis, okay. So, I, Travis, Travis, what? I think when we were fished last spring and the water yep. was warmer in that pool, I was not fishing what you would call the traditional soak it jerk bait rod. No, I, I had a heavier line yes. and I was ripping it and I was throwing, um, you know, it was a lucky craft jerk bait and um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not your typical jerk bait. It's got a secondary action, a little shad profile anyway, but I was ripping the bait and they wanted it ripped that yep. day. It was cloudy, a little bit of wind. They wanted that bait moving and they were on that bait. So what it boils down to, you guys don't think it makes a difference, but what, what you just said, 100% makes a difference. It's depth, speed, and cadence. And your, your reel can do that for you. Your rod can do that for you. And you have to understand the attitude of the fish. And if you don't have the right gear, you're not getting bit. Travis absolutely murdered me watching fish on a pan optics. I, oh. I had a I had a Randy Block at spinning rod. It was a noodle. I thought it was gonna be super cold and I was gonna soak the bait, you know, and I had six pound tests and I was gonna get deeper than he was. Oh my god, I got crushed because I couldn't snap the bait hard enough. I literally had to take my rod from in front of yeah, me I remember that. and jerk it as far back behind my back as I could and snap it to go whack, whack. And I had it on mono too. And finally, I couldn't set the hook because I I was behind my side. It was a it was just hysterical. Mm -hmm. But it boiled down to rod action. Yeah, and, what, I, and let I me. I'm gonna I'm day. gonna add one thing to that and get a little weedy. Yeah. But this is so yeah. important. Yeah. So important. It, it, it especially a cold water jerk bait, but even on a fast cadence, it can be the true too. You want a rod tip that intentionally leaves a little slack in the line where you're sure. where you're you're popping on slack instead of into the bait. And that's where the rubber hits the road because if you're jerking a jerk bait and you feel too much bait when you're jerking it, that bait's working abnormally, especially in cold water, where if you're popping the slack and the slack is bumping the bait, that's the deal. And, and, and that that's where that extra fast tip with that 10 pound line matters a lot, where if you're fishing something in fast cadence with heavier line, it's more of a stick, stick, stick. You can get away with that heavier line and that stiffer tip to your point. I, I completely agree, but it does make a big difference on getting bites. It's amazing, but it does make a difference. So crazy, man. I mean, it matters. Gear, little little details like that matter, 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 man. And that's when you get to that advanced stage. And, and Travis is great at teaching people about that right gear, right rod, right setup. You know, the spy bait rod, the, the, the hair jig rod. I mean, it, it matters. It matters, man really does as far as the uh the, the 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 victory the jerk what we're calling is that the one dan you said would be probably best in the colder water temps right to slow that bait down well you can do both but it will fish fluorocarbon with a that again I, i'm just going to go back to the default mode that one company but the mega bass 110 size just puts the perfect cadence on it um and it and it throws it without tumbling it, so you're not going to foul the hooks. Uh, they don't get off. Um, it, it just does a lot right. So yes, that would be the rod that I would recommend okay. now. But one the thing we will do when we're getting smaller with smaller jerk baits in cold water, sometimes with eight pound floral or even ten pound floral, is sometimes Travis. I'll go to an MM, believe it or not, and that's a smaller bait where you barely bump that line and that, that bait's going to react yeah. to it in a way where an XF will actually stick it too hard. That's really splitting hairs, but generally speaking, the average size jerk bait, average cadence, whether it's a five count or a 20 count, um, that okay. six, eight MXF is just the juice for, okay. for so many different things you can throw with it. Sure. Right. Do, do, do you throw a jerk bait uh, ever on a spinning rod? Is that, um, forgive me for not knowing the St. Croix models like Travis is talking about, but what do you guys prefer? Colder water, spinning rod, warmer water, bait caster. Talk to me. I'm so curious. I, myself, I'm throwing a bait caster all, all the time. I mean, I just, it's just a personal preference type thing. The good thing, sure. is, the good thing is that there is a six, eight MXF uh, spinning rod well Ooh. because there are both of those anglers out there i i get it um and yeah. we need it as a company um 
especially throwing like an X wrap or a really small X wrap or going sure. super small, super lightweight. Uh, I'm not going to say BFS, but I'm going to say uh, that, that 110, it's, it's become kind of like the Kleenex of jerk baits. You know, so you <laughs> judge everything about it. It's a Bobcat. It's a Kleenex. Um, but there is a spinning rod in the lineup and you can get a little smaller with that spinning rod and get a little longer casting distance. The only time that I'll switch over to a spinning rod is believe it or not, I'll go to a 3000, a 35, or even a four. If you really have to get some tremendous casting distance, uh, fishing super, super clear water on really spooky fish um, on lakes that have been uh, where they've been pushed on a little bit. So you, you I, I bumped up to 4,000 size reels and I'm absolutely loving it, man. I tell you, I'll never go back to a exactly. 3000. Yeah, Less man. line twist, more line pickup, man. I am yep. loving my life now. Yep. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna add one thing to that, Ryan. I agree. I throw it on a bait caster majority of the time. Sometimes spinning spinning rod if I'm going super light, super clear water, whatever. But the reason why I do it on a casting rod is in Travis. I was you uh, hearing you talk about the seven three for a jerk bait. I'm really interested in hearing more about that because for me. My cadence is straight down. I want the guides on top of the rod. And because I'm watching that little V that line makes out in the water, I'm watching my line jump as much as anything. So my cadence with a stick bait is straight down. And with a bait caster, I'm a lot better with that than I am a spinning rod. So it's not even close for me in terms of bass fishing, even smallmouth, largemouth or smallmouth with a jerk bait, that general 110 size. It's the cadence to me. The direction of the cadence determines the rod I use really more than anything. Mm -hmm. Sure. Interesting. A yeah. uh, lot of yeah. great comments. Guys are uh, are digging this information. Man, Dan, hey. not only do you make good rods, but you know a little bit about fishing, dude. A <laughs> uh, ton. <laughs> uh, these guys are going crazy in the comments, man. I hope you can see them. It's awesome. Uh, but back to uh, real quick on the jerkbait on the spinning rod. So I believe I am using, yeah, the 7.3 medium extra fast. For summertime applications, when I'm really, uh, I, I I'm I'm really jerking that erratically, and I'm trying to create a reaction bite. I'm rarely stopping that jerk bait, and and that's braid to a 10 pound fluorocarbon leader. That's when I'm using that spinning rod. Eric actually got me interested last year with a spinning rod because I saw the work he could do with it, and I realized I was kind of missing out by not using the jerk bait on both different, you know, a bait caster and a spinning rod. I think there's an application for both, not just preference. I really think you can make that jerk bait do some interesting things with the spinning rod. I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it with Eric. Well, and if you're fishing a super fast cadence from way out, you have so much better line control with a little bit longer rod mm -hmm. and number. And plus they're not going to get off as much with that. But I would think, Travis, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that you're working that with a slightly side cadence if you're yes. doing it. That, all right. That, now, yes. see, that makes perfect sense to me. If, if you're doing that, and yep. we're real rapid stick, 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 stop, and come up, get that reaction bite where they get a face full of it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a totally different cadence, little longer rod. I get it. I, I think you're nailing that. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I love it. I think it's working out great. It's, uh, it's actually it's led me to throw a jerk bait a lot more this summer because I have oh, a rod dude. that I feel like can handle that application where no I kind of felt lost before it, when I, and when I did that technique, it was always on a bait caster, but uh, we've had and a couple that lighter jerk bait that we were throwing up at the Champlain dude. I whipped it out there, man. Sure. I caught some good largies with it. I mean, it yep. just, it felt so much easier for me. It was a, a deeper diving. It's uh Oh man. It's, it, it's a, uh, what is it? An Imakatsu bait. And, um, you know, that thing on a bait caster, I don't know, man. And it was windy. I didn't have to worry about backlash and the bait tumbling. And if I got the bait weight right, man, I mean, that thing was like a rocket. It was just gone. And I could just make super long casts. And it got me a few extra fish, man. I, I really believe that. Yeah, so. guys, it's the same thing with a little topwater. Like a little super spook or something you're trying to throw. Super spook, Junior, you're trying little to throw in a mile. Look, that's seven three seven four you get it way out sometimes that cadence is rod tip up right where with Hell a six yeah. eight it's more down a standard traditional walk the dog deal so it, it it's the same analogy and i i agree with what you guys are doing that bomb cast fast cadence 
that seven three length is gold. I mean, you're the people watching this podcast, man. I'm not here to sell rods, but get it. That seven oh. three is really good for that kind of thing. I'll no tell doubt. you this. I'll tell you this. The little Rico, get yourself that seven three. You'll be thanking yeah. me later, and it wow. handles big fish. You'll never go back to a baitcaster with a smaller Rico, not the Rio Rico, because that's baitcaster all day long, man. But the re the little Rico. So you're a tiny popper mm. on the spinning rod, Eric. Oh my gosh, yeah, the small one for sure, yeah. man. I can outcast anybody with you a throw it a mile. Absolute um, on, 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 on braid. On yeah. braid, some guys don't even use a leader. Thirty pound oh, braid. Okay, they so just, I they never uh, look back, man. It's done, and they you, handle it. I'm talking Potomac, Upper you, Bay. You may have grass. Oh yeah, you may have said it. I was looking at the comments yeah. uh real quick here but it's the what lucky you... slevin it's in the lucky slevin lineup from st Clair for co anglers <laughs> i go. want what, that i want what would the lucky be, slevin what... you're gonna order me the lucky slevin i'll pay you for ryan it or I'm, dan, what I'm you... getting your okay. deal okay ryan and dan you gotta get me the lucky slevin st croix that's it okay i'm this is me i'm authentic i'm just i'm reacting now and i yes. want to fish with it next year on the yeah. legendary lakes tour so We're what going, would guys be... hold on hold on that's dr Krankenstein. you guys need that sticker that's the oh, bass man. lab sorry hold on that's Where's the, the bass legendary lab. lake sticker I'm getting there to it. It. i can't is. see there it is legendary lakes tour we're going to all the iconic lakes across america and travis has been trying to get me on saint Croix. i will not mention the company that i fish but if you know me on instagram you know what i love and he goes dude you got to come over and i'm like all right man well give me a rod to fish then man i want my lucky slevin combo um <laughs> make so, me a believer <laughs> so on a small pop bar what would be the model you recommend dan i'm going i'm throwing it either on the 68 mxf spinning rod or the 68 mxf casting rod okay but i want to try spinning to try to get that distance and make that bait work i'd go for the uh i go for the tactical the um the short okay. 68 mxf because i'm also demiki rigging with that um mm. yeah it's uh, I'm, now I'm, yeah if i'm throwing a little to to your to travis if i'm assuming you're th you're wanting to throw this thing a mile and yes. it's a little pop bar and you're running on braid yeah mono leader not that. fluoro because fluoro sinks right yep. you're running on braid to mono leader short stubby leader personally i would go a longer rod i, I would throw that on a seven three okay. um mxf is what I'd probably start with only because I'm trying to throw it a country mile. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm fishing around targets, six, eight all day long, but I think that seven, three will throw farther. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's no doubt on that one. You're right, Dan. Uh, well, well, really that, so you're saying that the same rod I use the jerk bait, that victory jerk bait, rod. Well, I, I'm going to call it the jerk bait. Rod totally. I have them. That would work. Okay. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, cool. You know, because here in this again, is going to get a little weedy, but when you're that far out with a pop R and everybody listening on this thing, that's fished a pop R knows we want that little kaplunk where it makes a bubble. That's what we want. That's our dream deal with a pop R we get, I've got some of those old ones in that bass color with the black, with the silver and grooves on it that still do that to this day that i change the hooks out and only use them when i really 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 want to that those that kind of bait when you're throwing it that far out you can get away with a, a little bit heavier rod because you're bumping so much line you got so much braid with a little bit of floor on your way out in the end of a cast where you can get that little kaplunk and put a bubble on it way out with a spinning rod i'm talking about a little pop bar if it's yeah. a bigger one, I'll throw yeah. it on a bait caster just sure. to, for the leverage to keep yep. them pinned up. But yep. the the little one, I I don't have any good scale here, but you guys know which one I'm talking about. Yeah, that yeah that little guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's got it. Oh yeah. Oh, don't you know I got it? Oh yeah, I got the P70s in here. You got oh, so yeah. much line out, you can get away with a little bit stiffer rod for that. Sure. Oh, oh, right on. You got me wanting to throw some top water. Dang it, <laughs> Travis. <laughs> What are we doing here? Um, south, hey, I'm going to bring Alex Alex back in real quick and see if we have uh, any questions for you guys that we missed. I know it's getting a little late. Um, welcome back, Alex. What do you know? P comments are going off. I think you're, uh, your volume's down. You're on mute. How about now? There you go. All right, there we go. So yeah, guys, comments been lighting on fire. A lot of people enjoying it. A lot of good information. I believe it was Dustin Taylor who said, 
I learned more from jerk baiting and learn more about jerk baiting from this show than I have in 35 years of tournament fishing. So we're not only <laughs> learning about the rods, we're also That's awesome, man. Some good information mm, on technique. Like but we had a question come in earlier from John D and he wanted to know about the 10 XD rod you guys were talking about that you had the guys in the Ozark down testing. Was that, he got a little confused. Is that a rod that has come out already? It's planning to come out rather soon. What's the update on that rod? No, that rod will be at a, uh, available 11-1 at, uh, okay. at retailers that picked it up. Um, it'll also be available uh, at, on the St. Curry website. But, yeah, I mean, look for it wherever you want to buy that rod. If you've got that special retailer, that special St. Curry retailer you want to create that relationship with, go that direction. Want to buy it from us, check on stcurryrods.com. But it's we want you to be able to buy that 10XD rod where you want to buy it. Right. And you guys know the real shot is uh, the store that we recommend. They do carry St. Croix rods. And if you, if you call them or send them messages, if they don't have some of these rods in stock and enough people here, you know, you've seen it before uh, you, you call up these places, they're going to get the hint real quick. So um, they definitely, uh, definitely support this, this show and the podcast. So if, uh, if you do, we definitely recommend, uh, trying the real shot first and you probably can use that little discount code i give out too we'll see what happens travis we're going to use those top water rods with spinning reels next year okay if anybody out there can the identify this bait you are a bait guru i don't know wow okay, I, i'm not going to tell you but this is a magic little bait when it's super slick high sun Whew. and it's got secondary action Secondary action. There are a few golden baits out there. This one happens to be vintage, out of production, of course. Of course. Right? right. You know. <laughs> anyway, so this is a prop bait, as you can see. Anybody know what it is? The name's on the top. I won't show you. Is that but, the original uh, Wonder Bread color right there? <laughs> it is. It, it truly is. It comes. I have a lot of different colors. What but, in the uh, world? It's crazy. So you when you when you sputter this bait, as most prop baits sputter on the back, right? You go zip zip. And this bait will go upside down and then roll back over. And when it rolls back over, that's when it gets bit. They're sitting behind that bait. That secondary action of that roll gets them to bite it. But, uh, yeah, St. Crest got it, man. Oh, J.P. Harrell got it. Man, a lot of guys, you guys are studs for knowing what that is. Travis, remind me to bring these baits. I want to bring a little box of gems, little poppers, and get some really spooky small mouse and super ultra clear water. High sun, if they're tuned into top water during the season, we're out. So that's right. Our legendary lakes tour, man. Let's go to work. So, hey guys, uh, uh, Steve asked if the St. Croix make blinks for rod geeks. I guess he's wondering if you guys sell the blinks at all to the public so they can design their own rods. Dan, why don't you take that one? Yeah, we do. And that's that's it. It's rod geeks. Um, you know, they are, uh, Using the St. Croix technology, you can look them up on the website. I, I, I is it St. Croix Rod Geek? Probably Rod Geek style. I'm off the top of my head, but um, yeah, we definitely do. Now, years back, we used to do all of that, you know, and sell all of, especially our U.S. made product, and provide to blank distributors and all that. But now, all of our blanks are purchased through Rod Geeks. Yep. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. It- Cool, cool. Did we miss anyone, Alex? Not that I can think of. That was definitely a question I was going to ask. Travis was a bunch of that. But I got a question for you, Dan and Ryan, um, before we let you guys hop off here. So obviously, like you talked about, you guys sort of have a slight advantage in the manufacturing arena, being that you make everything here in the United States. Does that give you guys a little bit of a jump start on the next five years while other companies right now are focusing so hard on where can I get these guides from? Where can I get these real seats at? And you guys are able to keep a lot of that in house and then you can focus on the next five years and maybe get you a little farther ahead than where those other companies are right now. The, uh, I sh- I'm, I'm going to say it once the check is in the mail because yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks for asking that question. Um, yeah. Uh, if, if you're not moving forward in this industry uh, you made some mistakes um, because fishermen were always changing. We're always looking for the next, uh, next best thing. Uh, our, our CEO, Scott Forrestal, says this over and over and over again. New product is the lifeblood of St. Croix. It's just it's just the way it is. We, we uh, as you can tell, Dan and I geek out about rods. Um, we, we also geek out about all other aspects of fishing from our boats, which I give Dan a hard time about all the time. We're constantly going back about stuff. Um, fishing, is, fishing is fun, uh, and it's fun for us, and that's what we're thinking about all the time. Now, with that said, um, 
we have historically always had releases at two major fishing events. And I will tell you that when the calendar turns to March, we will have a new product available at the Bassmasters Classic. And when the calendar turns uh, to July, we'll have product available at, at ICAST. There's without a doubt. Um, and it's not going to be it's not going to be BNG. And I'm not talking about biscuits and gravy. It's not going to be bold new graphics. It's new technologies. It's stuff that we're working on right now that the people that are in this room um, have been working on. Um, it's without a doubt, uh, the decisions and the homework that have been done in the past in regards to our supply chain and, and our vertical control have allowed us to do that. And I, and as Dan said, in the beginning of this, we can't speak for anybody else. There's a lot of really good rod companies out there. Um, and that's the greatest thing is you can be an angler and you can fish with our rods. You can fish with somebody else. You can fish with a mixture of them, pick the rod that gives you the best opportunity of the water on the water. Um, and I wish the best to any other rod manufacturers that might be listening to this because we know that that there's some challenges. But speaking just for us, we will have new product at ICAST. We will have new product at the Classic. Wow. I have, I have a question for you. Somebody mentioned in the comments the AGS guides. Mm -hmm. are, are, are you talking about the carbon fiber graphite? The entire thing is graphite? Yep, you got it. Yeah, so somebody said or they thought they were Daiwa. I have one of those Daiwa AGS rods, and I absolutely love it. And so my yep. buddy stepped on one of the guides, and I uh, can't find. So he super glued it, but I'm kind of hesitant to use it in um, tournaments. But um, anyway, tell so talk about that. Where how did you get the guides? Are they the same, or are you making yep. them? I mean, who makes yeah. them? No, so we have a strategic partner partnership okay. with Daiwa. Um, oh. Daiwa Daiwa and us both have access to AGS guides. That's um, pretty cool. Yep. Uh, just a, a side a side joke. Uh, <laughs> when I have my AGS guides out on the deck of my boat and you know, I have a camera guy or something, they step on them and they break them. My engineering team ties them back on pink for me, so I know exactly which <laughs> ones have been and ones have been broke. And that's engineering's little joke. Um, yes, um, we do share that guide platform uh, together. Very cool. Travis, do you know what those are? I mean, they're extraordinary because it transfers vibration and sure. bites. I understand the through. concept. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I, I'll show you the rod next time we're together. I'll bring it out. But it, it, uh, it's legit. I can't wait to see it on a St. Croix. I'm stoked. Yeah. Well, listen, Especially we, if it comes in the Lucky Slevin lineup. <laughs> we are we are running out of time, but I have I have a bunch of questions I got to get to yet. And a couple here in the comments. Are you guys OK for just a little bit longer? Sure. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um. Let's see. So Jamie and I have this question too. Jamie Newton wants to know uh, in the in the Croy lineup, what would be a good rod that you would recommend for glide baits and bigger swim baits? Ooh. So there are uh, three swim bait rods that came out in Victory. Um, they were tested by um, three guys on the West Coast um, that are our swim bait aficionados. Uh, these guys, that's all they do. They just they just throw big baits, and that's it. Um, Eric Van Scoy is one of them. Matt Frazier is the other one. Um, I'm having a blank moment here. In just a second, I'll think of the other. Sure. But that is that. Those are the those are the models that match our efforts towards swim bait. Now, there's one to three ounce. There's three to five ounce, and there's five to nine ounce rods in that mix. They are actual swim bait rods in victory that were built just to do that, to throw cool. big baits. And there's some crazy YouTube footage that's going to come out here pretty soon that um, of some stripers that have been caught on these, on the, up on the East coast, um, even on the West coast too. Uh, it's absolutely awesome to see these baits. These guys are throwing. Uh, right. It just made sense for us too. I mean, we, we have a heck of a musky rod um, collection mm -hmm. and have a great relationship with those anglers. Big baits are not foreign to us. Uh, we don't get scared over three ounces. Um, sure. We're used to dealing with big baits. This, these rods were constructed the same way Victory was. They're light, sensitive. They were built with a purpose, and that's to throw um, uh, throw big baits. Yeah. No, you guys, again, have an incredible lineup of rods. You have a great amount of ambassadors to St. Croix. I mean, speaking of musky, I mean, Joe Booker, right? Uh when it comes to Mosky in northern Wisconsin, he's well all over the Midwest. Uh, Joe Baylog, we had him on the podcast just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Big fan of St. Croix. I mean, there's a lot of anglers 
that are that that use and love your products and the, the general public i mean i don't know i find when i have clients in my boat and they i don't i give them the best of the best when they book a guide trip with me they're using st croix legend extremes for drop shotting deep and when they pick up that rod and with the perfect 3000 series spinning rod and five pound braid and the right setup i mean it's amazing like they they fall in love with these rods um everyone who's used them can't get enough of them and so i again i want to thank you guys for coming on um i know we'll, we'll have a few more questions in here and alex if you see some while well, while i'm i, I got to ask ryan and dan these two questions so i'm just curious ryan from a just being an angler yourself what's your favorite technique and and rod uh to target bass with dude i've I, I actually get giddy when I talk about this, but right. I absolutely, I absolutely love throwing. Um, Dan, I'm sorry, man. I got to let it out. I absolutely, <laughs> love, I absolutely love throwing uh, a big easy. Um, that's that's kind of my deal. Oh, I almost. What? I know. Yeah, yeah. I live in Wisconsin, and I throw. So a what big size? Easy. They make two Ooh, sizes, whoa. right? Uh, I throw both of them. Okay. Um, yep. Uh, you wouldn't want to talk your... about the color, would you? Uh, man, I'm going to send somebody to your house. You let too much out. <laughs> man, I'm in Florida. <laughs> I threw a handful of these in his boat three years ago, and man, am I regretting it. Yeah, no, I love, yeah, I love throwing yeah. them. I've, I've replaced uh, probably 75% of my usage uh, throwing a frog with throwing a Big Easy. Um, really? It's it's just really something. We Our, our green fish up here get so keyed in on perch, on log perch, and they get keyed in on bluegills that, uh, you know, I know there's – you can imitate those with a perch uh, or with a frog, but uh, throwing in red cabbage, especially when you look, you get down next to the water level and you see the stem sticking up, that says big easy to me. And the 73 heavy extra fast has such an important part in the victory rod lineup. It was a new skew for us. Um, took a lot of work, um, you know, a lot of broken rods and testing to get this right. It actually has a lot of ties back to, our ice fishing lineup, Croy Custom Ice, uh, specifically the 33 mm, um, to make this rod live with having a true uh, heavy rear end, but then having extra fast in the tip, so it'll operate very accurately, uh, all while having a lot of a lot of a low end power when you got to get fish out. Um, Joe Baylog has fallen in love with this rod fishing down in the St. Johns. Uh, I've just mm. heard some fantastic stories from from this rod, but. Um, I used to tell my wife that if I was struck by lightning, flipping a jig or flipping a D bomb, that I died a happy man. But I tell you, that's that's all changed since the Big Easy came around. Wow, so how man. how are you how are you rigging that bait? I'm I'm rigging on a VMC drop dead hook, um, four out one eighth ounce. Um, yeah, I'm, is that yeah. the one that has a black coating over the weight? You yes. got it. Yep. Yeah, I have a love hate relationship with that hook when it comes to um, how thick or how beefy that Big Easy is and being able to get the get the hook in their face, but it does it does stick them. Um, yeah, so, I, so I, I use a little bit heavier. Yeah, and I throw it. wire. Yeah, and the other thing that I challenge everybody to do, and you're gonna think I'm crazy when I say it, is I challenge everybody to toss it around on 80 pound braid. The reason 80. that I say, yeah, here's the reason. Um, 80 is so big that it doesn't. Yes, exactly. 80 is so big that it doesn't tend to ball up into pad stems or it doesn't tend to weed up as bad. It also mm. floats floats a lot better. Yeah. Uh, I sharpie it out um, yeah. as far as I can. And uh, if you look at the diameter of 80 pound braid versus like a 65 or even a 50, it's really minuscule. You get, sure. longer, you get longer casting distances. I fish it on a die with 200 HD, one of the old reels that has been retired out for some reason. Um, yeah. and tried to be replaced, um, lock the drag down, cast, cover a lot of water, let it eat. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's a blast. Wow. So oh, I, I can admit Travis, uh, now I got to uh, deal with uh, 80 pound braid next year. Dude, just, Thanks. Just, just, just uh, try up, it. Up, just upper try Bay it. Potomac, bro. Let's yeah, talk. Right. Just try it. Are, so are you, are you also fishing that now you said it replaced like, like, like a horny toe, like a zoom horny toe and stuff like that. Totally or? replaced that for me. Yes, yeah. exactly. And 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 I've been so excited watching oh. Z-Man with this goat frog that's going to come out at some point in time. I'm mean, so excited, but I, I know at the end of the day, um, if I can get fish active and not have to put a frog in a in a spot, in a in a hole in grass um, and have to work it back and forth or work it on a bog edge or, 
Uh, if, if I can, if I can get them to eat on the big easy, I can cover water so much quicker. Are you, are you, oh, are you fishing that subsurface surface or are you also like, how are you, how are you, is there different retreats for this? Wine and grind, keep it all up on top. Um, you know, the challenge is, is some big easies are golden and some are, you can't figure out why the heck they don't work right. But you look at the, okay. the tail angle, the good ones have the tail angles that are completely 90 degrees. Okay. You get some that were molded bad or somehow they got some heat in the package and they don't get that gurgle sound. But if you can, uh, if you can get the good ones that have the gurgling sound, keep it up high, cover water. Um, huh. You can, you can really, you can really catch a lot of quality fish that are ready to eat that day hey would you like to come back for a patreon where people pay 10 bucks to hear what you have to say because that's, that's patreon awesome. level stuff <laughs> no, i'll no, tell no. you what i'm gonna do eric I just, welcome I to the pop. free patreon all 194 of you just send 10 dollars to travis i, I have and, a I have ten dollars i have a huge box up here that was getting ready for an auction coming up and in that box is a ton of big easies that are now going to come back off way. of that Dude. Now you gotta now you gotta look and I'm see the tail now. straight, man. <laughs> I send them my I'd way. Say, the first time I threw a big uh, uh a skinny dipper, oh. um, I was paired with a guy as a co-angler on the Potomac, and uh I was picking up and I asked him if I could, uh, because they they weren't released yet. So he had them before anybody else did. Um, what was his name? Brennan Bosnan. Brennan Bosley. Yeah, Brennan Bosley. And uh man, I gotta tell you, I was like, what is that bait? And uh, this was a long time ago. And uh, so I took the burnout ones. And when they came out, I took them to the upper bay. I was throwing on fluorocarbon. My buddy was throwing on braid. And uh, I was letting them sink into holes in the grass. And it was just like magic. It was cr- It's like they'd never seen it. You know, eat it. Uh, money shot violet. I mean, the chartreuse one. They ate the fire out of it. And I was throwing on a, uh, a Stanley ribbit frog hook. with the, And it made this thing. It had this wobble and roll to it, so I could, you know, keep it on top. I could subsurface it. I could drop it in lily pad holes. It was like they'd never seen it. It was unbelievable. Yeah. I got to pitching it around to clumps of grass. I was pitching it with a little heavier weight on a Texas rig. I murdered them on that. I had that all to myself for a while, and then it just got, you know, took off. So, yeah. and then a lot of swim baits came out. But uh, so, yeah. It's the greatest thing we... is if, if you get one to miss on it, you keep a punching rod handy, you know, a seven oh, yeah. and a knockout punching rod right back yeah, in. Oh, if they yeah, miss yeah. on it, they're, they're, they're nine so times fired time, up. They're, they're gonna whack the punch. You're gonna punch a or whack a punch rig anyway. Yeah, okay. I would I would throw a pack of crawl, uh, you know, on a, a one ounce to get right down to where they yep. blew the hole out and and uh, with a oh. rattle zoom rattle, uh double double steel ball bearing, man. They couldn't take it, you know. Pack of crawl, boom, right there, they would eat it 90% of the time. Yeah, they would just fire after it. Good it's stuff, always a man. good live when I learn something that I'm like excited about that I gotta like after this go online and buy a bunch of stuff. So I gotta Heck get yeah, some man. of those VMC hooks. Anyways, uh I want to ask Dan the same question, but I do want to take another question here in the comments before we go there. Ray asks, what makes the victory lineup so good compared to the higher end St. Croix rods? What's your take on that? I think we both would have different different uh answers to that question but um you know one one thing is is it's a price point rod that we designed for an actual price point that um we feel that you can justify having a few of them and be able to cover a bunch of techniques uh i get a great comment because that's come up numerous times before is a lot of these rods you don't have to buy a bunch of them do a lot of different things um we've heard that from our kayak anglers we've heard it from co-anglers already but uh, the diversity of the series and the sheer amount of work that was put into this series of not thinking of things we've ever done in the past, um, but looking at this series from a white piece of paper uh, and bringing it forward. Uh, this series is super diverse uh, at a great price point, 15 year warranty built in Park Falls. Um, some of the most durable material in the industry, uh, uh, Fuji Concept O's. Uh, durable. I mean, those, those rot, those guides aren't anything flashy that anybody's going to talk about on, on, uh, you know, a, a forum to talk about how great componentry is, but I tell you what, those guides are tough. They're, they're durable. They, um, transmit vibration. Well, um, you know, we, we were able to test them out in our sensitivity testing. Um, uh, Dan, you'd probably say something completely different than me on, on that, to the regards to that answer. 
I tell you, whoever asked that question, I have a lot of respect for that because somebody is a good angler that realized how good victory is. And I'm not just saying that. I'll be specific. The handle diameters are one thing. The uh, guide platform was Ryan went there. That's true too. Lengths, powers, and actions and blah, blah, blah. But what makes victory really special, in my opinion, is the material. And it's a blend of two that we've never done before. It's an SC3 primary carbon, which is what made Avid such a rock star. But there's another material called SC6, which is a higher strain that's laid up in the manufacturing process before the blanks even rolled. And every single Victory model has a different proportion of SC3 and SC6 in it. So they're they're kind of freak shows. We've never done anything like that before. And that it makes them really special. And, and it's hard to explain to the official especially a lot of these different rods. And I, I really respect that question, whoever asked that, because obviously that person has fished our higher end rods before, but they see something special here and they can't really, they don't really know why. That's that, that a lot of it's what goes on that you can't see. It's in, it's in the blank and that SC3 plus is really, really cool stuff. I mean, I'll put it up next to really anything we make and that's a strong statement, but in terms of just being fishy, Ryan knows this. I've always said that SC3 has always been our, in my opinion, our fishiest material from keeping them pinned, not popping them off, not tumbling baits, not blowing up reels, just all the things you look for that you want a rod to do from a material standpoint. You can fish moving baits with it. It's great crankbait material. Where SC5, in my opinion, sometimes gets a little stiff, you know, mm -hmm. so this, this material is really sweet in Victory, um, but it's a blend of two. And they're all different. Very cool. Awesome. Well, Dan, let's uh, let's talk about your favorite technique and and rod to throw that on. Yeah, teach. I can't believe you gave that up, man. But I, <laughs> I know a lot of people out there throw it. But if you're going to give it up, I'm going to give it up a little bit more. Back up on the big easy a little bit. I'm going to give you two colors, just because now that the cat's out of the bag. Um, <laughs> Okay. If you're around vegetation and bluegill beds and you're not throwing copper field, you're smoking something. So buy that copper color. field. Okay. Hands down, they eat it. It's a bluegill color with a little bit of red metal flake in it. It's the juice. It's It's got just enough opaque on the tail where you can actually see it, uh, which is big. And the second color I like is white ice. And that's because I can see it. I'll take a chartreuse zoom pen, spike it a little bit on the side to make it a little sexier, but it's a bait that I can see if I'm throwing it a mile back in pencil reeds, all I'm looking for is that thing to disappear and I can see it yeah. and they bite it just as good, especially pre-spawn cruising bass. It's it, I'll put it up against any color out there. So mm. uh, I know that skinny dipper, we throw a lot in white up on pool nine and 10 on the Mississippi river. And yeah, right that's on. just a smaller profile version of what I'm talking about here. It so. is. Yeah, but, it is. It is. So, my go-to, and Ryan knows this, I've got a little jig I got out of the Ozarks from a friend of mine. It's a little pill head. I, I make them up myself once I get the heads. It's three-eighths ounce. Um, it's so lethal. I can catch them all over the country with it. I'll throw, I got a blue one and a uh, brown one primarily. The I'll put a little bit of a tinsel in it, just a little bit. I hand tie them all but you can skip it. You can swim it. You can pitch it. And to your point, I'll run a pocket on it a lot. That's probably oh, my yeah. favorite warm water trailer. Cause that mm -hmm. thing freaks out when it falls, it's got this deal no, going down and they just sure does. eat it. But that is the bait that I kind of, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say I start with it all over the place, but I usually start with it all over the place sure. till, till I have to put it down because even up where Ryan lives, I mean, those lakes up there, get around a boat dock. You can catch every single dock fish on this jig. They just don't catch on to it. And I know he's laughing because he knows it's true. It's, it's crazy good. So that's, yeah. that's my go-to. And I, I run it on 15 pound fluoro. So I'm running on a relatively light line and I'm running it on a medium, heavy, fast. That new seven, three MHF is beautiful. Cause I can get bit 10 foot off my rod tip and flat out swing on them and not break them off. Is that the nice. Marshall? Is that the Marshall? Yeah, oh, okay. it's totally awesome yeah. for that let, bait. Let me ask you this, because I want to get back to your score, but I don't want to forget about this. I'm being selfish here because I love that rod as well, that Marshall. How about for throwing swim baits in open water? Can you see that working on that rod? Well, for a big easy, it's too light. No, no, no. Okay, I'm talking swim jig. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, a it's real good jig, for that. A finesse swim jig. Oh, yeah. Three-eighth ounce with like a grub. 
Yeah, for small yeah, models. yeah. You, you know, you were talking about that one rod to list out seven applications and everybody's going to have it in the rod locker. I'll tell you another bait to throw in that 7.3 MHF, which is yeah. just stupid as a buzz bait. Because you oh, can throw it a mile, yeah. and the first turn of the handle, that blade's kicking. You don't have to kickstart it because the rod is okay. just stiff enough. It's just stiff enough. It'll throw the bait without tumbling it. It'll turn over on the first turn of the handle, and they don't get off. You can throw it a country mile. You put the tip up, and you get all your line off the water. Yeah. There's okay. so many advantages to okay. it. it it's yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I just broke my 7.3 from the other manufacturer, and uh, they don't <laughs> Eric, make that, rod. Covered, they don't make that rod anymore. I'm hoping you're writing this lucky seven you. selection I, down, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I got you. Don't, don't um, make me fish the other brand on the Legendary Lakes Tour, if I could say it again. <laughs> Dan, are you, you love saying that, Legendary I, Lakes Tour. Dan, the, uh, the three-eighth ounce uh, pill head that you're talking – so you make those yourself. Like you're Well, the heads are made by a buddy of mine. Okay. Uh, Ryan knows him, but I, I buy the eyes. I actually buy 3D eyes and I super glue them on. My and man. then the, the the skirt I get from a company called Skirts Plus. I'll just say it. Um, and then I get the tinsel as Flashaboo um, and I'll hand tie everything in. Uh, but if you get it proportioned, then I will, I will, I do trim the skirt back just past the bend of the hook. I think that's important. I want to make it very compact. It makes it more skippable. Plus, they just flat out bite it better uh, than this big long thing. You'll you'll find a lot of times when you buy them off rack. So it's a finesse jig for sure. Yeah, it's a little compact thing. But li listen, guys, I mean, I can I can drag it post spawn when they're pulling water on pea gravel. I can flip it under a boat dock. I can skip it. I can swim it. I'm telling you, it's so many things that you can do to. Wow. You can fish it as almost as a fish finding moving bait deal it's so good so wow that's so this, uh this pill head skips oh big time yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't have thought Dang. that we're yeah. talking pill head oh yeah what now granted that? if i'm wanting to skip it i don't do a yeah. pocket chunk no right okay i'll, I'll do more like a regular zoom on. yeah just any type of flat i mean sometimes i'll even cut off a little piece of a beaver Right, sure. Because they skip so well, so oh, it depends sure. on Bob, Bob. it depends yeah, yeah. on what. If I'm skipping it specifically, I take the pocket off. Yeah, right on. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. I love it. I love it. Wow. wow. Is that Dude, a do you, it? Is that a do it mold? Uh, out of curiosity. You know, I I wish I had that mold. Uh, someday I'm gonna pin that little guy down, and I hope wow. he's watching this podcast. <laughs> sure. and, and pin him down and get his mold from him. But man, I buy those. I buy these things by the hundred count. In, oh yeah in brown and blue and it's yeah. uh it's a good one i did Dang. a little shake shaky jig worm i'm sorry i have to show it but please do yeah yeah it's a shaky head jig worm man and it's a shaky head but it's a jig it's got a little hackle on the front and man i i stick some big big fish on this it's not quite a jig it's tied sparse it's not quite a shaky head it's got a little longer, but I throw a salmon worm on the back flat. It's just got a lot of action, and it, it just it just gets bit. I'm down with that pill head, though. I got to try that. All right, I'm going to hold it up, but nobody take pictures. Can you see that? Oh. Can oh, you see that? Oh, oh, oh. There it is. That's all I'm going to show you. And you got and you got eyeballs. Teach, on it. I had to, I had to do it. What's the timestamp here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Wow, <laughs> good stuff, man. Thank you for giving up the ghost. So Dude, I didn't expect just, all this, guys. We got some good fishing information and rod information tonight. Heck Big yeah, time, man. Really good stuff. Oh, um, live. Wow. Man, Alex, anything mm. else we didn't catch? I mean, this was good. I don't want to keep you guys. We could go on and on. In fact, we'll probably have to invite him back maybe over the wintertime. Maybe uh Maybe talk about some of the upcoming things that are that are coming out of St. Croix and, and get people fired up about some new products. So you guys are oh, definitely yeah, welcome. Welcome back anytime. Absolutely. Bring two That's new it. techniques and the lucky Slevin <laughs> co-angler pack. I'm ready. <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, thanks for having us on, guys. Great stuff, man. Great stuff. Thank you. Cool. cool. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate yeah. you. Awesome. Appreciate, awesome. Appreciate you too. Thank you. All right, guys. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water. All right, I'm going to end this.